Voilà, bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Je suis vraiment content de vous accueillir ce soir. Content aussi de revoir des têtes qui étaient déjà là hier. Donc c'est que les gens euh, ont vraiment accroché. Alors c'est une soirée euh, qui sera aussi exceptionnelle, vu qu'on a toujours la chance d'accueillir parmi nous euh, Richard Hoover, qui est un des plus grands spécialistes euh, dans le domaine des météorites. Il nous vient tout droit de la NASA. Il est venu exprès des USA euh, pour ses exposés-ci. Alors en fait, euh, il est venu à l'invitation des, des collègues de la faculté polytechnique et de, de la Malogne. C'est une organisation commune avec l'UMH dans le cadre de l'exposition « Ces pierres tombées du ciel ». Et euh, hier, en fait, M. Hoover nous a parlé de ce qu'il croit être des fossiles de bactéries présentes dans toute une série de, de météorites d'origine cométaire, notamment. Euh, donc, on a vu pas mal d'images assez étonnantes qui semblent montrer, d'après ce, ce qu'il dit, que ces, ces bactéries seraient d'origine extraterrestre. Bon. Alors, il euh, n'y a pas encore de consensus là-dessus, c'était le, le sujet d'exposé d'hier. Aujourd'hui, il va nous parler un peu d'une thématique plus générale, qui est euh, celle des liens entre apparition de la vie sur Terre et euh, comète et astéroïdes. Mais je vais laisser la parole à mon collègue Jean-Marc Bal de la Polytech, qui va vous présenter plus en détail M. Hoover, pour ceux qui ne le connaîtraient pas encore. Voilà, bonne soirée à toutes et à tous, et bienvenue à Mons. Merci. Oh, juste quelque chose... Euh, Merci à Pierre pour toute la technique, c'est pas simple, et à Madame Ouchmaya pour la traduction en direct. Voilà. Oui, et merci à Francesco pour euh, l'organisation de cette manifestation qui est vraiment très très efficace. Je tiens à le répéter, ou le souligner en tout cas, je ne sais pas si je l'ai déjà dit hier, mais je l'ai peut-être oublié, mais en tout cas je tiens à rectifier. Donc bon, bonsoir à tous. Euh, nous sommes très heureux d'accueillir pour la seconde fois euh, le professeur Richard Hoover de la, de la NASA, qui, je le répète, a fait le trajet spécialement de l'Alabama pour venir faire des conférences extrêmement intéressantes, plus que des conférences, parce que vous voyez qu'il y a du matériel euh, dont ça c'est nouveau par rapport à, à hier. Alors, qui est le professeur Hoover Le professeur Hoover est en fait euh, leader du groupe d'astrobiologie, comme c'est indiqué, euh, au euh, Marshall Space Flight Center euh, à Huntsville, en Alabama. Donc c'est un groupe interne à la NASA qui s'occupe des questions d'astrobiologie, l'origine de la vie sur Terre, mais aussi les liens avec euh, la vie possible éventuel sur, euh, enfin, en dehors de la Terre, donc dans les environnements extraterrestres. Alors, Richard Hoover est un, est un scientifique, euh, est un très bon scientifique de laboratoire, vous en, vous en rendez compte avec ce microscope. Ne vous y prenez pas, hein. euh, c'est un microscope qui a l'air très vieux, il est doré, effectivement c'est un vieux microscope, mais il est complètement tuné, il est extrêmement efficace. Euh, c'est d'ailleurs le microscope que euh, Richard emporte euh, sur le terrain, et parce que c'est ça qui est très important, c'est un scientifique de terrain, il a parcouru les quatre coins de la planète à la recherche de bactéries, euh, extrémophiles dans des environnements très très hostiles euh, et surtout dans les environnements de type par exemple Antarctique, euh, Alaska euh, et d'autres. Euh, alors il, il emporte tout ce, tout ce matériel. Alors c'est un scientifique de terrain, d'ailleurs il n'a pas peur d'affronter les intempéries belges aujourd'hui même encore pour euh, récolter des échantillons qu'il va vous montrer après le, la conférence et le cycle de questions réponses qui, vont, euh, qui va suivre. Euh, c'est normal, hein, quand on vient de l'Antarctique je pense qu'on n'a pas peur d'affronter la grêle de Mars euh, en, Bel en Belgique, enfin du mois, du mois de mars, je veux dire, hein. je ne vais pas faire de jeu de mots euh, <rire> qui, qui prête à confusion. Euh, et donc voilà, je pense qu'il euh, a un, cu un curriculum vitae kilométrique, je ne vais pas l'énumérer, pas loin de 40 bouquins, 40, euh, livres qui ont été édités, voire euh, euh, dont il est auteur, plus de 300 publications scientifiques, et je vous passe les distinctions euh, honorifiques. Et euh, encore une fois, je suis très très content, Richard, que tu aies fait le déplacement de l'Alabama pour venir ici. Et j'espère que tu seras content aussi avec les échantillons que tu as récoltés euh, ici en Belgique. And uh, now the, the audience is listening. Ah. Merci. Thank you very much, Jean-Marc. I'm delighted to be here with you again this evening. Uh, the subject is slightly different than yesterday evening. Uh, I'm talking about comets, meteorites, and the origin of the biosphere. <laughs> The origin of the biosphere concerns one of the most fundamental problems of astrobiology. It is extremely important to try to understand how, where, and when life originated, uh, and also is life restricted to the planet Earth or is it a cosmic imperative? Uh, will it exist wherever the appropriate conditions for life exist? And also what are the physical, the chemical, and the environmental limitations of life? So for that reason, we study microbial extremophiles. 
and the spatial and temporal distribution of life. We're very interested in, in the most ancient life forms on the planet. How far back does life go? And is, how is it distributed on planet Earth? Because that will give us indications as to where and how we can best look for life elsewhere in the cosmos. Another question is, is life on Earth endogenous or exogenous? Uh, by that, we mean, did it originate de nouveau on the planet Earth, the life that we see here, or was it carried here uh, in, the, in the concept of panspermia? For a long time, that question has been believed to be absolutely settled, but I'm now suggesting that uh, perhaps it needs to be thought about again. Uh, the other fundamental question is, did comets and meteorites play a role in the origin, evolution, and distribution of life on Earth and in the cosmos? Well, there have been a number of very widely held uh, views, strong, uh, commonly accepted, uh, that are now being challenged by recent discoveries that have been made concerning comets, meteorites, and microbial extremophiles. One of the first widely held views is that life originated on the primordial Earth by way of abiotic processes, uh, Miller-Urey and Fischer-Tropsch synthesis. And of course, it's been known for quite a long time that you can utilize uh, electrical discharges and so forth in a reducing atmosphere. And by catalytic reactions, you can produce a whole host of amino acids. And back when, when this was discovered by Miller and Urey in the early 1950s, it was thought, aha, we now know exactly how life originated on Earth. And it was widely believed at that point in time that since you could, in a test tube, manufacture the amino acids that are required for proteins, that it would only be a very short period of time before we would be able to go into the laboratory and make a nice simple cell. Of course, in the early 1950s, simple cells existed. We thought a cell was a nucleus containing uh, uh, or, uh, uh, genetic material within the, the envelope of the cell, or if it was a eukaryote, the genetic material in, in a nucleus, and that it was sort of floating around in a liquid, and you had a nice simple membrane, and voila, that's what constituted a simple bacteria or a simple cell. We now know that there are no such things as simple cells, and all of the microorganisms, the archaea and the bacteria of the prokaryota, and, and the uh, diatoms and protozoans uh, uh, and uh, cells of, of mammals and humans and so forth, are all phenomenally complex. And, and in fact, the difference between the, the nature and mechanisms of a cell of a bacteria or an archaea and a human brain cell is far less significant than the difference between an inorganic structure and the simplest of all living cells. It has also been believed for a long time that comets are pristine protosolar nebula materials that have been unaltered essentially for the last 4.6 billion years. Uh, that uh, belief uh, is, is something that uh, has been generally accepted, but people were not paying attention to the fact that comets are continually colliding with other bodies, and therefore they're accreting material from other bodies elsewhere in the solar system. It was also thought that comets were porous, frigid, dirty snowballs. This was the model of Whipple, uh, and, and ex extremely widely held that they were devoid of liquid water and therefore sterile. Uh, new evidence on biomarkers in, in uh, uh, carbonaceous meteorites and evidence for microfossils in the meteorites uh, indicate that uh, uh, these uh, kinds of ideas may have to be significantly re-examined. The prevailing paradigm for more than a century has been that the Earth is a closed system and uh, that life originated on Earth, de nouveau, and, uh, and then it went through all of these various stages of evolution in which you went from the simple cells to the more complicated uh, eukaryotic cells. Uh, as far back as 1871, von, von Helmholtz uh, considered the exogenous origin of terrestrial life. And uh, Arrhenius advanced this concept uh, in, the, in the notion of panspermia. But those were fairly rapidly discarded by the scientific community and considered as total nonsense because there was no way that biology could possibly come to Earth other than being formed here uh, originally. In 1924, Operin had suggested that asteroids and interstellar dust particles might have delivered water and complex organics to the biosphere of the early Earth. Uh, and 
Uh, Von Helmholtz made the statement, who could say whether comets and meteors which storm th everywhere through space may not scatter germs wherever a new world has reached the stage in which it is a suitable place for organic beings. I must say that the scientific community has largely regarded these ideas as uh, very, very strange and far out and, and not worthy of significant uh, consideration. In 1961, George Klaus and Bartholomew Nagy uh, shocked the scientific world when they announced the discovery of structures in carbonaceous meteorites that they considered to be biological. Well, they weren't actually searching for microfossils or evidence of life. Uh, it, 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 as it turned out, uh, Naj had just obtained some very sophisticated uh, chromatographs that he was using for studying the organic chemicals within petroleum deposits. And he decided, well, I can use this kind of equipment to study meteorites. And when he started looking at carbonaceous meteorites, he found that they contained a complex suite of very, very intricate organic molecules that were very similar to what he knew from petroleum deposits. And of course, he felt very strongly, as everyone in the day did, that oil was, was the formation of living organisms. And therefore, he decided to look for fossils. And he found a wide variety of tiny spherical bodies that he interpreted as microfossils. And then the scientific community started shouting and screaming that this was impossible and, and he was an idiot for thinking such things. And so he backed off and started calling them organized elements. And, and in fact, uh, it, it is quite possible that many of the things that he found that he thought were microfossils were uh, coatings, organic coatings on abiotic mineral grains, as was proposed by Rosignol, Strick, and Barghorn in 1971. In 19, uh, uh, that should be 1997, uh, uh, the, uh, the results of the Allen Hills 84001 meteorite uh, produced the first uh, subsequent evidence uh, since that time for the possibility of, of uh, microfossils and meteorites. Uh, but those have been largely rejected as being too small to be life, and, and there, of course, are a host of, of associated uh, uh, chemical biomarkers, and many people in the scientific community are attacking these from a variety of, of ways. Uh, I can't say for sure that the forms that were found by McKay were in fact biological, and the problem is they're too small and, and simple uh, to, to be recognizably biological. In 1962, Yuri, when he was uh, talking about the discoveries of, of Bartholomew Nagy and George Klaus, said that if these things were found in terrestrial objects, they would be undoubtedly bio uh, considered biological. But the problem was they were found in meteorites, and everybody knew that meteorites were basically uh, volcanic-type uh, rocks. They contained olivines and, and a variety of other igneous materials, and, and since life was known only to be associated, fossils only to be associated with sedimentary rocks, then they couldn't possibly be biology. Uh, of course, at that point in time, no one on Earth knew that life existed in the deep crust of the Earth. No one on Earth knew that there were microorganisms that, and, and other organisms that lived within these uh, great uh, smokers uh, that are essentially volcanoes erupting at the seafloor. So uh, as, as a result of that, uh, it was considered that the forms that were found couldn't possibly be biological. New data that we've obtained from the environmental scanning electron microscope and the field emission scanning elect electron microscope and the elemental evidence from the energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy has shown that there are structures within the meteorites that are indigenous and, and are very complex and have the characteristics of microfossils. Uh, therefore, the meteorite data suggests that the cosmos may extend far, the, the biosphere may extend far into the cosmos, as was suggested by Vernadsky. So the long-held paradigm of the exogenous origin of life on Earth should be very carefully re-examined. And, and my apologies to Milton, but I would like to, uh, I would like to take you through a few paradigms lost. Uh, <laughs> One of the things that uh, we, we have a great philosopher in America who was a baseball player, uh, Yogi Berra, who had some very wonderful sayings. And one of his was, uh, you can, you can uh, observe a lot by just looking. And in fact, a lot of the things that people have thought they knew have turned out to be completely wrong. And, uh, and it took 
someone who had the, uh, the uh, wherewithal and the, the uh, intelligence to look and see if what was thought to be correct actually was. One of the early ideas was that all living things require oxygen. Well, that was invalidated by Pasteur's discovery of anaerobic microorganisms, and he stated fermentation is the, comp uh, is the consequence of life without air. Anaerobic microorganisms are very, very important on Earth, and uh, that's the field that we have been concentrating on at uh, the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, I, I happen to have a very fine anaerobic microbiologist working with me, Dr. Elena Picuda, who was trained by uh, uh, academicians of Arzin and, and uh, Dr. Jelena in the Institute of Microbiology of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Vinogradsky showed that the idea that all, all life required organic matter was also wrong uh, when he discovered uh, chemoautotrophic microorganisms. These are microorganisms that live on, uh, on chemicals. They, for example, can, can live on iron or they can live on sulfur or they can live on hydrogen uh, and a variety, variety of other uh, mechanisms that they utilize to obtain their energy from chemical reactions rather than utilizing uh, food that, as we normally think of it as sugars and proteins and so forth. Well, it was also thought that biology and geology were independent, and, and in fact, the fact that that is wrong has given rise to this uh, very important new field of geomicrobiology. Uh, Kern shown in 1856 that the atmospheric oxygen was produced by photosynthetic organisms. Uh, Bernadsky uh, talked a great deal about the role of life as a transforming geological force on Earth in his uh, works La Geochemie and uh, Biosfera in 1924 and 1926. Oprin made profound contributions in his book The Origin of Life and Haldane in Possible Worlds. And then the famous Miller-Urey experiment uh, showed uh, the formation of, of amino acids in reducing atmospheres. It was also thought that our key in Earth was devoid of life. That was invalidated in 1953 when Tyler discovered microfossils in the 2.1 billion year old Gunflint chert. They were morphologically similar to cyanobacteria uh, such as Lingbia and Oscillatoria and, and they, uh, they, they named the, uh, the forms that they found uh, with the uh, uh, the, the genera names of, of modern organisms, but putting on a suffix like Oscillatoriopsis or Paleolingbia to sh indicate that they were similar to modern Lingbia or Oscillatoria, but they were, in fact, uh, ancient forms. Uh, here is a Heliconema, uh, very similar to Spirulina and other cyanobacteria. And in 1996, Mosius uh, produced a paper in which he showed evidence that life has existed on Earth for about 3.8 billion years or more. Now, the, the fascinating thing, this is uh, modern Spirulina, and uh, unfortunately the movie isn't working, but maybe I can show you the movie later. The, the fascinating thing is that uh, life appeared on Earth almost identically when liquid water appeared on Earth. So this means that uh, our, our notion of a long period of evolution from inorganic materials to complex biological entities simply cannot work. Uh, th there cannot have been a long period of time because liquid water didn't appear on the planet Earth until uh, at somewhere around 4 to 4.2 billion years ago, and we know that at least 3.8 billion years ago, biology had come to exist on the planet. Um, this is a calibrated tree of life modified by Javot, and, and it shows the, uh, the fascinating thing that we now have three domains of life, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya, and, and it is interesting to note these are all of the guys that, that uh, live in, in uh, uh, the extreme environments, uh, we have uh, the high temperature organisms, the low temperature organisms, the uh, methane uh, producing organisms and so forth are all in this nice domain of archaea and it's actually closer to human beings, to the, to the eukarya, uh, than, uh, than the bacteria. Well, one of the things that is exciting is, is new regimes have been discovered where life exists on Earth. It was thought for a long time that life couldn't exist at high temperatures because everyone knew that the DNA molecule, which is critical for life, is destroyed when, when the temperature goes above 60 degrees Celsius. And when uh, Thomas Brock discovered organisms growing in the Great Fountain Geyser at Yellowstone National Park, 
up in, in this beautiful uh, geyser at 70 degrees C, the scientific community knew the guy had to be completely uh, wrong because no biology could exist at such high temperatures. But then Brock and others discovered that this particular organism had a special enzyme, uh, and, and that enzyme that he named the organism Thermos aquaticus, and taking TAQ from Thermos aquaticus, he named the enzyme TAC polymerase. And what happens is the TAC polymerase allows the DNA to stay together at temperature above 70 degrees Celsius. And that has given rise to the polymerase chain reaction kind of process where you can take DNA, you can put it with the attack polymerase, and you can heat it up and get it high enough temperature that the two strands come apart, and then you cool it down, and each of the two strands selects the material and builds a new uh, carbon copy. So in one cycle, the one DNA molecule becomes two, then the two become four, and the four become eight. And in a very short period of time, you can take a small amount of DNA and make an enormously large amount of DNA that's all identical to the particular gene that you've selected. And that has made it possible to do an enormous amount of new scientific discoveries, including the, the decoding of the, uh, of the genomes of a large number of microorganisms and ultimately the, the decoding of the entire human genome. So the decoding of the human genome was ultimately made possible by Brock's discovery of Thermos aquaticus growing in uh, the Great Fountain Geyser of Yellowstone. Corliss, uh, on his expeditions to the bottom of the ocean, discovered these hydrothermal vents that were teeming with life at temperatures above 120 Celsius and 260 atmospheres. Any scientist would have known this was impossible uh, not too long ago, but a lot of times that which is impossible simply isn't recognized to be possible. And this is a, a microorganism that we uh, named therm Thermococcus thioreducens that we discovered from the uh, Rainbow Deep Sea Hydrothermal Vent, and that was published just a little over a year ago. Tommy Gold had argued that there were microorganisms deep within the crust of the Earth, and uh, that also was considered absolutely impossible. But now it is well known that, that, that the deep crust of the Earth contains a host of, of uh, lithotrophic organisms that are actually rock eaters. Uh, these are some electron micrographs I did of some uh, samples that Tullus Onstott sent to me from the 3.3-kilometer uh, uh, depth in the Witwatersrand gold goldmine of Driefontein, South Africa. You can see there are some very, very unusual microorganisms here. This looks perfectly like an alien creature. Uh, this one also, and in fact, it has this very intricate flagella. Uh, when I looked at it in 2D X-ray maps, uh, I found that here you can see this uh, flagellar structure in gold, and you can also see this entire organism in uranium. So this organism has been living in, in the deep rocks at Driefontein and concentrating gold and uranium, and uh, we think putting it on the outside of the, uh, of the cell wall as a way of getting rid of this pesky stuff that it doesn't really need. Uh, during uh, the year 2000, I had the opportunity to go to Antarctica, to the South Pole, the Teal Mountains, and, and the Patriot Hills uh, with Jim Lovell and Owen Garriott. And on the way down, well, actually, we went to Antarctica, and then we flew back because we encountered a storm just as we were about to land. And we came back to, uh, uh, to uh, Chile, to Punta Arenas, and uh, we were stranded in Chile for three days. And so uh, the next day after we finally recovered from our 14-and-a-half-hour flight to Antarctica and back, um, in fact, when we were about to land and the pilot announced that he had aborted the landing, I looked at Jim Lovell. I said, this is all your fault. He said, why do you say that? I said, you go to interesting places. You get to where you're going, fly around a little bit, turn around and go home, never bother to land. <laughs> of course, he did that on Apollo 8 and Apollo 13. Coming back, we had three days uh, to rest and, and enjoy ourselves. So we went to the southern tip of Chile to the Straits of Magellan. And there I found some nice Magellanic penguin guano in a nice small pool. And I was on my hands and knees scooping up penguin guano into a sterile vial. And Jim looked at me and said, Richard, what are you doing? I said, don't look, Jim, but this is very nice stuff. Well, it turned out out of that one sample of penguin guano, we have succeeded in, in isolating and describing three new species of bacteria and one new genus. This is an interesting form that we call Trichococcus patagoniensis that grows actively at 5 degrees below zero Celsius. 
I just got back uh, from uh, uh, the Schirmacher Oasis of Antarctica where I was collecting uh, samples of ice. This is a beautiful ice cave that we visited in, uh, in near Novolazarevskia Station. Really quite a spectacular uh, place. Uh, you see here the beautiful blue ice uh, back in the depths of the cave. Uh, you can walk back and, and it continues to go uh, for a great, great distance. Uh, so we had a, a lot of enjoyment exploring this ice cave, and I took a lot of samples, and we've already got some new species uh, in pure culture now from the ice cave. Also, I, I collected African penguin guano, and we have some magnificent microorganisms from the uh, African penguin guano in, uh, in South Africa, right on the, uh, the coast uh, near Cape of Good Hope. Well, in in 1969, Sabita Buizov uh, from the Russian Academy of Sciences uh, uh, proposed that there would be microorganisms in the deep ice of Antarctica, and, and everyone knew that this was, in fact, kind of a crazy idea, but uh, M. Shinetsky at the Institute of Microbiology decided the best way to get Sabita Buizov off his back was to send him to Antarctica, let him spend the winter there, do whatever sampling in the drill course he wanted to do, because he probably wouldn't find anything anyhow. And he had the courage to go to Antarctica to Vostok Station in the winter, which is an incredible thing. I would never dare to do such a thing. But when he got the samples back, he discovered that they contained microorganisms. And many of the microorganisms that he found in the deep ice cores of Vostok are actually still alive. Uh, this is diatoms. You can see two complete frustules uh, from 2,827 meters depth. Uh, and, and actually, it goes down to 3,690 meters. In fact, they're very close to the ice water interface. Uh, there is a huge lake un, uh, under uh, 3,697 meters of ice at Vostok, and, uh, and we're hoping to get into that lake at some point in the future if it's possible to figure out a way to get into the lake without contaminating it because it's the best terrestrial analog to the kinds of things that you may find in, in the oceans that exist beneath uh, some of the interesting icy moons of the solar system like Europa and, and Enceladus and Ganymede and Callisto. While I was in Alaska, I collected samples from the Fox Tunnel, which is frozen in the permafrost, and, and the ice had been frozen there for 30, 32,000 years, and we found a new species of living bacterium that we called Carnobacterium pleistocinium. This is the first known living organism on Earth that was actually alive during the Pleistocene. So these guys were probably consumed from time to time by the great woolly mammoths. Well, one of the fundamental questions is what is the role of comets in the formation of the atmosphere and oceans of the early Earth uh, by delivering water and ice and volatiles? And it has now been recognized that comets played a very, very important role. Next question is, did comets and carbonaceous meteorites and interstellar dust particles play any kind of role at all in the origin and evolution of life itself? Well, we know that during the Hadean, there was an enormous period in which there were huge impacts between 4.5 and 3.8 billion years. And, and those impacts of comets and, and meteorites during the Hadean and asteroids uh, brought a lot of complex organics to, to the early Earth's biosphere. And Vild, in 2001, by studying oxygen isotopes in detrital zircons, uh, came to the conclusion that, uh, that uh, the early Earth may have had liquid water oceans uh, as far back as 4.4 uh, billion years. The fascinating thing is, if we look at this work of Robert et al. in 2000, one of the intriguing, here he has compiled uh, the, the deuterium hydrogen ratios from a wide variety of, of objects in the cosmos. And, and one of the things that is very interesting, if we look at the deuterium hydrogen ratio of comets and CI meteorites, uh, and, and in fact the Earth's oceans, we see that there is a rather significant overlap between these. If you look at the deuterium hydrogen ratio of the protosolar nebula, of planets like Ju Jupiter and Saturn, of the interstellar medium, they look nothing at all like these numbers. So the deuterium hydrogen data is very suggestive that comets and, and uh, uh, CI meteorites are related, and, and also that comets may have played a very important role in delivering water to the Earth's uh, early oceans. 
we know that impacts happen. Uh, we have become very, very much aware of that by this spectacular sight that we were able to see with the impact of shoemaker Levy on Jupiter. Uh, this uh, uh, comet came in and broke into several pieces and made a number of colossal impacts uh, on the planet Jupiter. Uh, there are many astroblims on Earth where you have evidence that huge uh, impacts have, have uh, occurred here. And so the question is, when these uh, bodies came into the earth, did they deliver not only uh, uh, organic chemicals, but did they also deliver perhaps intact uh, genetic material or even viable microorganisms? Well, as I said, it's currently thought that comets are, are totally uh, sterile, uh, that they have uh, ice and, and that the water ice goes directly to gaseous uh, 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 it, it sublimates directly to water vapor without going through a liquid state. And if that is true, then, uh, then it is uh, uh, likely that uh, life would not have developed rapidly on comets, would not grow rapidly on comets, although there are microorganisms that can live within ice and can locally melt ice. But generally speaking, in order to have rapid growth of biology, you need the water to be in liquid state. Uh, well, Due to some recent discoveries, I'm suggesting that the validity of this concept has to be challenged and we have to, to strongly consider that it may in fact be completely wrong. Uh, one, the first idea that comets are pristine protosolar nebula material is clearly not valid because we see, for example, in this stardust image of comet Pville 2, there are all these craters. Clearly, and, and in fact, on all of these, uh, like the asteroid 243 Ida uh, and, and every comet that we've gotten a close look at the nucleus, there is clear evidence that this thing has been collided, uh, bombarded by collisions with other things within the solar system over and over again. And therefore, if it collided with debris that was ejected off Mars or debris that was ejected off the Earth or, or Europa or wherever else, then it now is no longer strictly pristine protosolar nebula material, but has other material mixed in with it. The vast majority of the, of the cometary body is protosolar nebula material, but all you have to do is, is impact upon it uh, samples of material from other bodies, and particularly if these contain viable microorganisms, you could easily have contaminated the comet with, with life. Well, the first crack in the idea that comets were uh, nothing but dirty snowballs came with the last apparition uh, in 1986 of Comet Halley. Uh, we sent an, a complete armada of spacecraft to Comet Halley because this was a phenomenal opportunity. And the first thing is that they discovered that uh, there were clathrate ices and water, which was well known and well understood. But the astonishing thing, just as Sir Fred Hoyle and Chandra Wickrama Singh had predict predicted, the nucleus of Comet Halley was absolutely jet black. It was not white. It was black. And it was so black that it was actually blacker than coal. It had an albedo of about 0.02 to 0.03, among the blackest things known in the cosmos. The Vega IR spectrometer found something even more astonishing. And that is that at 0.8 AU on the inside of the Earth's orbit, the temperature of the, of the cometary nucleus actually got as high as 127 Celsius. Everyone had believed that the temperature of these comets would remain around 200 Kelvin, but here it was uh, at, at 0.8 AU at 400 Kelvin. Now, this is far above the melting point of ice, of water ice, and therefore you have sufficient energy and sufficient heat for water ice on the inside of the crust to change from, from solid to liquid and, and ultimately to steam at this kind of high temperature. The only way that you could keep it from going into a gaseous state is by putting it under very high pressure, like a pressure cooker. Um, the other point was they, they observed very bright jets e emitting from the nucleus, and Eberhardt found uh, by his spectroscopy data that the Halley volatiles were 98% water, 1.7% methyl alcohol, and 0.41% hydrogen sulfide. So basically, most of the volatiles in Comet Halley uh, is, is the volatile uh, H2O. 
This is a beautiful image of the nucleus of Comet uh, Halley. Uh, and you can see how black it is. But you see these jets streaming out from the comet. Uh, the albedo is 0.03. As I said, it's one of the darkest objects in the solar system. It is similar to the Tagish Lake meteorite, uh, to the Murchison and, and Orgoya meteorites, and to the D asteroid 368 Haida. This is Comet Hale Bop, just five days after perihelion. Uh, we had uh, predicted uh, in, in work I did with Sir Fred Hoyle back uh, many years ago and John Wickramasinghe uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the spectral characteristics of Comet Hale Bop might have components similar to, to biological entities. And, and here is the detailed spectrum of, of Comet Hale Bop. And this is a mixed uh, culture of bacteria, diatoms, and olivine. And you can see we've got a very nice match between Hale-Bopp and, uh, and the biological entities. And, and this is the galactic center source, GCIRS-7. Uh, the, uh, the dots uh, are representing the, uh, uh, the observed data from, uh, uh, from the galactic center source. And the line represents measurements from a mixture of, of diatoms and bacteria. Uh, and you can see that the model matches very nicely, even in this very strong dip at 8.7 microns. Well, the Deep Space One spacecraft obtained spectacular images of Comet uh, Piperelli uh, in uh, 2001. Uh, again, we see a very interesting jet black. Uh, icy nucleus that was 10 kilometers long. It had a black crust and, uh, and again, geyser-like jets of, of gas and dust and vapor spewing out of the, uh, of the comet. Uh, Soderblom, who was the principal investigator on one of the major experiments uh, studying uh, Borelli, made the statement, these pictures have told us that comet nuclei are far more complex than we ever imagined. They have rugged terrain, smooth rolling planes, deep fractures, and very, very dark material. This was totally unexpected by the scientific community. Just a couple of years ago, we had a very, very interesting uh, uh, piece of, of uh, cometary material to examine. Uh, comet uh, 9P Temple 1 came uh, uh, close enough to the Earth that it was possible to send a spacecraft to, uh, to Temple 1 and, and not only explore the comet, but send an impactor into the comet. And the idea was that this impactor would smash into the comet, and they would be able to look at the crater that was formed and be able to look at the spectral characteristics and, and learn a great deal about the nature of Comet uh, Temple 1. Well, uh, they got beautiful uh, spectral data. This is data from Sunshine et al. And you see the water ice absorptions here. So it is an ice-rich rich, uh, uh, nucleus, uh, water ice-rich. And this is out near Mars at 1.5 AU. And this is their temperature plot of the comet. Uh, and notice that even at the distance of, of uh, Mars from the sun, the temperature gets up as hot as 330 Kelvin. Uh, and, and at, of course, 273 Kelvin is uh, zero degrees Celsius, the freezing point of, of uh, ice uh, and, and the transition from liquid to solid, uh, liquid water to solid ice. And notice that essentially the entire comet at the orbit of Mars is at that temperature or slightly above. And in fact, uh, this data is strongly indicative to me that it is remaining at that temperature and not plummeting below it because the phase change between frozen water and liquid water is maintaining the stability of the temperature at that, at that point. Now, if you look at this little speck over here, this is a video that they did of Comet Tipple 1, uh, but it was taken before they impacted. And you notice that, do you see that giant flash there? And again, from time to time, the comet just all of a sudden becomes very bright. Uh, boom, like that. Now, that is flaring. That is occurring naturally without anything impacted. Again, a gigantic flare there. Without anything impacting on the comet, all of a sudden, the nucleus of the comet essentially explodes and becomes phenomenally bright compared to what it is normally. I'm convinced that what is happening here is this temperature is high enough that water is going from the solid state 
into the liquid state, and if it's contained within the crust, it's going into the gaseous state, into water vapor or steam. And as long as the crust is strong enough to maintain the, the pressure so that the steam remains inside, everything is fine. But because of an impact or because of a fracture or a weakness of the crust, every once in a while, chunks of crust blow off. The crust fails, and you get an enormous explosion that blows out a huge amount of dust and ice and, and water vapor, and that causes the nucleus of the comet to appear to get dramatically bright in a very short period of time. Uh, this is the, uh, the impact movie, and, and that's actually the site uh, at the time that the, uh, the deep impact uh, uh, structure was sent into the uh, comet nucleus, and you see some of the craters here on the nucleus of Comet 9P Temple 1. As it turned out, they didn't get a good image of this impact crater after it hit because so much material was blown out, they couldn't actually see what they had done. So they never got data on what the crater that they produced actually looked like. So basically, the point is that comets have thick black crust. They get very hot when solar heating melts subsurface ices near perihelion. Uh, and in fact, it's not just at perihelion. Even as far away from the sun as, as the orbit of Mars, their, their nucleus is still getting quite hot. The jets and spontaneous flaring indicates high internal pressures. And at any pressure above 6.5 millibars, uh, water goes from a solid to a liquid state before going to a gaseous state. That strongly suggests that liquid water can exist on the interior of cometary crust, and therefore life could exist uh, on, uh, on beneath the surface of the crust of a comet. Pools forming in cavities and films between the rocks and the ice could provide very, very useful microenvironments suitable for growth of microorganisms, very similar to what we call cryokonites. In, in the polar regions, you have black rocks that get trapped in glaciers and get trapped in, in the blue ice of, of Antarctica and, uh, and, and the glaciers uh, in high mountains. Those were first discovered by Nordenskold, and, and he called it cold ro black rock dust. And he gave these things the term cryokonite. And I've done a lot of studies of cryokonite communities. It turns out that here you have a beautiful system where the rock gets hot, the ice melts, the rock drops down into the ice until it finally gets to the point that the sun doesn't shine on it anymore, and snow comes along and forms a crust over the top of it that then freezes, and now you've got the rock that periodically gets hot when the sun gets close enough, high enough that it can shine on the rock, and so little pools of water form, and microorganisms grow, and they produce gases as their, as their metabolic products, and these gases collect under the ice crust. So each one of these cryokonite environments is its own little planetary system with, with an atmosphere, with an ocean, with, uh, with, with minerals uh, associated with the rocks and so forth. And those kinds of systems in the polar caps of Earth, I think, are perfect analogs for what may be going on in, in the type of biology that might be occurring on comets. Uh, the cryokonite microbial ecosystems are very complex. They have primary producers like uh, photosynthetic cyanobacteria, archaea, bacteria, algae, diatoms, and so forth, and they have decomposers, the, uh, the organotrophic bacteria, fungi, yeast, and so forth. And the complex organic molecules on many comets have been found, uh, and they're considered to have formed by chemical reactions when the nucleus uh, uh, was protected from stellar ultraviolet radiation. But they could have resulted from the action of indigenous biological activity. So comets have long been considered to be pristine and sterile. And, and in fact, that idea is clearly reflected in the planetary protection protocols. And we have within NASA uh, an, an office that is strictly responsible for planetary protection. And one of the things that's very interesting is if you look at the planetary protection protocols that have been, been established, uh, it's stated essentially that you don't have to worry about sample containment or handling uh, beyond what you need for protection of your own samples for scientific purposes. If what you're studying are the moon EO new comets, uh, interstellar dust particles, and with a very high degree of confidence, and bodies like Phobos, Deimos, and, and so forth, undifferentiated metamorphosed asteroids and differentiated asteroids, and all other comets 
with a lesser degree of confidence. So basically this is saying we know there's nothing biological in these kinds of objects, so we don't have to worry about it. We can bring it back in our lunch pail if we, if we don't mind having uh, uh, cookie crumbs on the, uh, on the samples we're bringing back. But strict containment has been ruled for bodies like, uh, um, like Mars and Ganymede and P asteroids, D asteroids, interstellar dust particles, uh, and those are the same uh, containment criteria that are required for Mars. And basically, if you look at what those criteria are, are you essentially have to treat return Mars sample like they can to- contain the Ebola virus. Uh, they have to be treated w- in, in very high uh, strict containment. Uh, you have to be uh, ex- extremely, well, in fact, the, the plans are that you, you try to make sure you sterilize any samples from Mars on the way back to Earth so you won't uh, have endangered any life on Earth by bringing back Mars alien microorganisms. So, uh, I, I think this is a very, very bad idea because as far as I'm concerned, the most wonderful thing I could get my hands on would be some beautiful Mars bacteria. <laughs> Most organisms on Earth, most of the bacteria on Earth, are good guys. It's only the few bad guys that give all of the rest of the good guys a bad name. Well, life forms that might inhabit comets have to be able to tolerate long periods of extreme cold and desiccation after brief exposure to high temperatures. So it goes near the sun, it gets very hot, and then all of a sudden it's cold for a long time and and maybe exposed to hard vacuum and so forth, so they dry out. uh, And and if this is going to kill them, then uh, they're not going to do very well if if they are present on a comet. So we have to consider anaerobic or microaerophilic conditions. Uh, uh, they would have to be able to, cont- uh, to carry out a- a active uh, uh, photosynthesis uh, or at least chemolithotrophic metabolism in order to utilize hydrogen sulfide uh, or organics that might have been left behind by prior, prior uh, microorganisms uh, on the cometary body. Uh, long-term survival in a frozen state is absolutely essential. And the fascinating thing that archaea bacteria, cyanobacteria, and diatoms uh, all have genera with these kinds of properties. Well, so the discovery of extremophiles, uh, 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 asteroids, and meteorites have uh, led us to conclude that comets may not be sterile uh, and, and that microbial life might in fact be able to exist uh, in comets just as it exists in ice. So the question then is what kind of microorganisms do we see commonly in the polar regions of the planet Earth? And if you go to Antarctica or you go to Siberia and you look in permafrost, uh, you see very much uh, the kinds of things that you would expect. Uh, you see lots of cyanobacteria. The dominant life form in, the, in Antarctica are the cyanobacteria and the diatoms, far more than anything else. Uh, even though the penguins are cuter, perhaps, uh, there's far more biomass in, in the microorganisms. This is a Mastigocladus laminosus from Mount Erebus. Cyanobacteria are photoautotrophs that use water as a photoreductant. Carbon dioxide is the primary source of cell carbon, and they release oxygen when they carry out their life processes. And in fact, it's well uh, accepted now that about 2.7 billion years ago, cyanobacteria played a critical role in the changing of the atmosphere from a reducing to an oxygenating atmosphere. Uh, this shows the cyanobacteria alingbia in, in an electron microscope, and here you have uh, living cyanobacteria. You can see that the uh, filaments look very different depending upon the way in which you look at them. So basically, microbial life thrives on Earth wherever you have liquid water and a source of these biogenic elements. These are the major ones. There are a group of other lesser elements that are important, but carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur are the very big, important uh, biogenic elements. But you've also got to have a source of energy. And it has recently been discovered that liquid water uh, quite probably exists on comets. And there had also been discoveries of liquid water, evidence for liquid water on a variety of moons of Saturn and uh, and Jupiter, uh, including there's a, an article just out today about evidence for a liquid water ocean underneath the ice crust of uh, uh, of uh, Titan, the moon of uh, of Jupiter. Uh, I'm sorry, the moon of, of Saturn. This is the Matanuska Glacier, and I was collecting a sample from the ice here. 
but coming out of the ice just about uh, two foot below was a big column of liquid water that was being formed by the rocks melting uh, the ice and the water went down into a crevasse and then came roaring out of the side of the glacier. This is the Fox Tunnel in Alaska and, and here we have fungi, blue and white fungi growing on the ice of the Fox Tunnel and the temperature there is uh, four degrees below zero at all times or, or lower. Uh, it has recently been discovered that this beautiful moon of Saturn called Enceladus is actually ejecting volcanoes of, of water and ice that's spewing out that plays a critical role in the formation of one of the outer rings of, of uh, uh, Saturn. And the, the ice volcanoes are associated with these structures down here called tiger stripes. And uh, the Cassini spacecraft just recently flew through the liquid water that was being spewed out of, of uh, uh, the ice cracks in Enceladus. Uh, here is some of the Cassini data showing some of the many locations where they've observed geysers to erupt. And the temperatures have, uh, have been measured at these locations to be 273 degrees Kelvin, which is clearly indicative that that's the magic number of melting of, of ice into liquid water. <coughs> this is David McKay's argument uh, for microfossils and meteorites and uh, we'll talk more about microfossils and meteorites in a moment. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things is that Mars has liquid water, uh, frozen water in, in this crater. We see here a, a, a water uh, pond on the bottom of the crater and evidence for snow around the rim of the crater. Uh, recently th there was found evidence for ice rafts uh, on a frozen Mars sea. And here's a picture of the permafrost of Mars and you can see that it has all of these beautiful polygons and, and separating the polygons are these nice double rims. Uh, the double rim polygons are very common in Siberia and Antarctica and they're formed by freezing and thawing of ice that pushes the ground apart every time more ice freezes and then when it melts in the, in the spring and summertime water flows in around the edges of the ice wedge and when it freezes again the water expands again and, and so little uh, mounds of dirt are pushed up on both sides of the ice wedge. Uh, the double rim polygons are, are proof of, of freeze-thaw cycles on Earth and uh, Professor Papa and I have written a paper in which we've argued that the evidence of double rim polygons is evidence of the existence of liquid water along the edges of these ice water interfaces on Mars today. The Murchison meteorite is a very important meteorite because it contains a, a complex array of, of organic chemicals, of amino acids and, and other complex organics. It actually uh, arrived on Earth in 1969. The orbital parameters are, are here, 3 AU and perihelion point 992 AU. And the fascinating thing is that uh, we definitely know that the parent body was not Earth, the Moon, or Mars uh, because the, the uh, elemental abundances are very much like the solar abundances uh, except for the volatiles. Uh, so the possible parent bodies of the Murchison meteorite include uh, Phobos and Ceres and, uh, and uh, the sea asteroid 1979 VA and the nucleus of Comet Finley. Uh, the magnetites are 4.6 billion years old and the exposure age is 800,000. This is some of the microfossils that I found in the Murchison meteorite. Many of you may have already seen these, so I'll go through them rather quickly. Here you see in, in the phosphorites of Hoobsagul, Mongolia, a microfossil very similar to what we have in, in the Murchison meteorite. Uh, this is uh, X-ray maps that show the carbon content of the microfossil, uh, and, and very importantly, we see here in, uh, in the... Uh, uh, the nickel map and uh, the sulfur map that there is no dramatic difference between the content of the fossil and the surrounding meteorite and that is taken as evidence that the fossil belongs in the meteorite and is not a recent contaminant. I didn't show you these last night uh, but I, I see that you have in the display a beautiful sample of the Tagish Lake meteorite. Uh, Tagish Lake uh, came in on the 18th of September in 2000 and, uh, and I was in the wrong direction. I was at the South Pole the exact day that the Tagish Lake meteorite uh, landed in Canada. Uh, but it contains a variety of very interesting and exciting things. These are framboids uh, and, and as uh, uh, 
Uh, Jean-Marc will tell you framboids on earth are associated with biology. They're found in, in soils. They're very common. But these are very beautiful uh, framboids. And one of the things that's very interesting is if we look at these framboids, we can see them in carbon. So they obviously have a carbonaceous film. We can see them in oxygen. And, and here we can see the framboids in, in iron. And we can also see them in sulfur, I mean in phosphorus. But they have also sulfur. So uh, these framboids show that they do have uh, uh, coatings uh, that are consistent with biogenic elements. Uh, but they are absolutely certain that they are not uh, uh, recent contaminants. Uh, this is a stack of magnetite platelets uh, that are in the Tagish Lake meteorite. Uh, these structures are very interesting and very exciting. They're, they're commonly found in the Orgoya meteorite as well as Tagish Lake. Um, I can't tell you what they are or how they're formed. I have no idea what, what is causing these kinds of exquisite uh, stack of magnetite uh, platelets. Uh, but I think they're incredibly interesting, and uh, I hope someday someone will figure out uh, what is causing them to be there and, and how they're formed. This is another picture at slightly higher magnification of the framboids in the Tagish Lake meteorite. And here are two framboids in the Orgoya meteorite. You can see that the Orgoya framboids are not nearly as beautiful as these in Tagish Lake. Uh, in fact, uh, these are the most perfect and, and spectacular framboids I've ever seen. I've, I've never seen any even, even from Earth uh, materials that look uh, quite that, uh, th that with quite that degree of perfection. The Argaia meteorite fell in, in France in 1864. Uh, there were a huge number of brilliant explosions, and uh, f a fireball was in the sky. Uh, it was so bright that many of the inhabitants of the little villages of uh, Argent Saint Clair and Noique and Argaia thought that uh, the uh, it was the end of the world. Uh, they they thought it was some gigantic firestorm, uh, and uh, and and it was quite a terrifying exper experience. Uh, uh, I'll show you a few other microfossils than what I showed last night. Uh, uh, this is a sheath, and you can see that it is infilled partially, and, and the other part of it is, uh, is empty. Uh, the EDS spectrum here is taken right there on the empty sheath, and we're seeing 67% uh, carbon, no nitrogen, 9% oxygen. So this is clearly consistent with uh, a, she a, a carbonaceous body that has been diagenetically altered. There are some very strange things in this meteorite, like these things that we call the fuzzy balls. Uh, we don't know what they are, but they're, they're very curious because uh, uh, I was having a great deal of difficulty focusing the scanning electron microscope on these fuzzy balls. And, and then I discovered that the reason I couldn't focus was because they were actually, this is a broken area of one of them, and you see these tiny nanotubules of iron this is a 500 nanometer bar here. This is an 80,000 X image. So these nanotubules are 10 to 20 nanometers in diameter, tiny hairs that stick out from the, from the interior of this fuzzy ball. Here, here we see them here. That's a 200 nanometer bar. And you can see how, how each of these is, is a small fraction of that, uh, of that uh, measure. I have no idea whether these things are biological or not. Uh, uh, this is a cyanobacterial-like filament, like microcoleus. Uh, but the fascinating thing is sitting right by the side of it is a single crystal of elemental iron. Now, when you look at this, it's, it's essentially pure iron. It has no oxygen content uh, that's uh, significant at all. It's uh, about 1% oxygen and 97% iron. Uh, and and the fascinating thing is it doesn't oxidize even when it's exposed to the atmosphere. So it's a single crystal of elemental iron. Uh, I think this is probably a, a particle that uh, came to the meteorite parent body from a supernova explosion. So this is probably uh, uh, material from, uh, from other stellar systems as opposed to from our own solar system. <clears throat> we, we find some very unusual forms within the Orgaia meteorite. Uh, this is very similar to some of the sulfur bacteria that have been studied by the scientists in Spain. Uh, you see it ends in a big glycocalyx type structure with a small uh, sphere here. This sphere is, has a high iron content. Uh, and then when we look back here 
on the uh, uh, white area just below the ball, that's this area in here, uh, we see that the carbon is 9.5%. Uh, again, nitrogen is undetectable, 0.01%, uh, which isn't a real detection. Uh, magnesium, 12.6%. Uh, but this one, surprisingly, has, has a fairly high degree of, of silicon and 24% iron. Uh, I had mentioned last night and showed you this beautiful form uh, that is a thin carbonaceous sheath. And you see this nice twisting and coiling here. Uh, and I had mentioned that oscillatory and cyanobacteria become stuck to substrates. And as they, they move, they frequently uh, leave behind a hollow sheath. And, uh, and here is an example of just such a twisted, coiled, hollow sheath. But this is not from the meteorite. This is from 3,611 meters beneath the surface of the ice at Vostok, Antarctica extracted from a Vostok core. So biologists will have no trouble at all in considering this to be a biological entity. It's an empty sheath of, a, of an oscillatoria cyanobacteria that has remained behind after the cells have left the sheath uh, uh, as a motile trichome. And this is one of my favorite images of the Orgaya meteorite, there's that big long coil thing that I just showed. We're just looking at the top part of it, a flattened uh, empty sheath here. And you see all of these nice, lovely uh, uh, cyanobacteria-like filaments. And, and here we see it in the backscatter image and the secondary electron image, and then in carbon, nitrogen. And in nitrogen, we can barely trace a little bit of this filament. Um, we can see there is a, an overall nitrogen level in the entire rock as well as in some of the filaments, but it, 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 it is almost below the level of detectability. Uh, in magnesium, we see all of these filaments, and, and they show up very brilliantly in sulfur. Uh, they're negative in silicon because the rock has much more silicon than the filaments. Uh, they're also negative in iron, uh, almost unobservable in phosphorus, but you can see them faintly in nickel, and you can't see them at all in sodium. So this set of images clearly says to me that these things belong in the meteorite. These are not recent contaminants that crawled into the meteorite after it landed. And here's that big, beautiful one that was up at the top, 45% carbon, uh, no detectable nitrogen. Sorry about the duplicates. These are uh, very complex forms in the meteorite that have structures consistent with what we know as heterocysts in cyanobacteria. They use this for fixing nitrogen. And here is a very beautiful uh, complex filament from the Orgaya meteorite to, with a hair at the end. This is an electron transparent sheath. You can see the electron transparent wrinkle sheath here as it's lifted off of the, uh, of the body of the, of the trichome. Uh, and, and when we look at it right here, uh, it has an almost pure carbon content. Well, one of the studies that I've done to be able to distinguish whether these are, in fact, indigenous uh, fossils or whether they are recent contaminants is uh, this is a different plot than I showed last night. Uh, here are the Murchison and Orgaya filaments. These are, are fossils uh, from the Archean, from Karelia. 2.7 billion years ago on up to uh, Eocene fish uh, in uh, here the uh, uh, and uh, the a bone of, uh, of Nitia. Uh, this is material from uh, Vostok and woolly mammoth. Uh, so these uh, these forms are of different ages. Uh, the yellow one here is at 1,240 uh, meters in Vostok and and the uh, uh, I'm sorry the the pink one is 200 uh, 40 meters, that puts it back about uh, 50,000 years. Uh, the other one is 1,002 uh, meters, uh, so it's about uh, 35,000 years old. Uh, these are uh, hairs and tissue of, uh, of woolly mammoth. This is the uh, tissue of the 32,000-year-old mammoth and the hair of the mammoth. And this is uh, hair of a 5,000-year-old pre-dynastic Egyptian mummy. And here we have modern cyanobacteria. Uh, living and uh, and some samples that were collected in 1816 and 1834. The schizonema is actually diatoms from 1834. And you see 
these ancient and old, but not, I mean, modern and old, but not truly ancient, have the same general uh, carbon-nitrogen ratio, whereas the, uh, uh, the filaments uh, within the meteorite and, and truly ancient things have dramatically different carbon-nitrogen ratio. The same kind of plot now with carbon-sulfur ratios, modern cyanobacteria, Vostok, Archean fossils, and the Murchison and Orgoya filaments. And, and this is just looking purely at nitrogen alone. And you see the Orgoya filaments. This is almost a flat line because I've, I've, I've set it at 0.5. I'm saying it's below that. I don't know how much below that, but that's the upper limit of the nitrogen content in all of these Orgoya filaments. Uh, these are Murchison filaments. And, and this, uh, uh, this, uh, this green bar here is uh, one that uh, uh, this is a Murchison contaminant, a fungi that I showed last night. So uh, the, the green and the purple are from uh, uh, the uh, contaminant actinomycete and the fungi. So these are modern biological in the Murchison meteorite. This is a, a filament that I consider to be a, a true microfossil. And then all of the rest of these are living cyanobacteria. And these are old filaments uh, like mummy hair and, and uh, carnobacterium. Pleistocenium are, are bacteria from the ice of, of the Fox Tunnel, and Mammuthus primogenius, 32,000-year-old, uh, here in the blue, and, and, and the, uh, uh, this is the tissue, and this is the hair. Uh, and then here we go to trilobites like uh, Paranopsis interstricta, Paranopsis pagidia, and, and the ancient uh, cyanobacteria from 2.7 billion-year-old Karelian material. So this chart clearly indicates that uh, truly ancient stuff, trilobites and, and ancient cyanobacteria, have nitrogen content consistent with the Orgoya filaments, which are completely different than the nitrogen content that we see in, in modern living cyanobacteria and in old material uh, back as far back as uh, woolly mammoths of 32,000 years. So basically, in summary, the evidence of biogenicity is that the fossils found in the meteorite are restricted to very narrow size ranges that are totally consistent with trichomic prokaryotes, uh, uh, filamentous sulfur bacteria, the cyanobacteria. Typically, the trichomes are 0.8 to 5 microns in diameter, and the filaments are, in general, less than 30 microns in, in diameter. In fact, that's the largest diameter filament that I've ever found in either Murchison or, or Goya. There's evidence of cellular life in terms of the fact that I can see cells and cell walls, crosswall constriction, septi, hairs, and, and even lophotrichus tufts of fimbriae, and evidence of motility in that you can see emergent trichomes and hormogonia and empty helical coil sheaths. You can also see evidence of rep reproduction in dividing cells, diplococci, chains of cells, aconites, coiling hormogonia, baocytes, colonies, and complex mats. And in fact, uh, when, when I've been able to see multiple forms that I think I can identify in, as to genus and species, I've found, uh, for example, Microcolius thonoplastes type forms in close uh, proximity to Formidium frigidum type forms and Formidium tenuissimum and species of Nostoc. Those have all been reported as being found in close association growing in Antarctic cryoconite communities. Additional evidence of, of indigeneity is that the filaments are embedded in the rock matrix. The elemental composition of the filaments is consistent with the rock matrix, but showing significant enhancements in carbon and, and uh, essentially no nitrogen in almost all of the cases. Uh, uh, the other point is that cyanobacteria are aquatic photoautotrophs that require light and liquid water in order to grow. Cyanobacteria are not like fungi. They don't go around crawling in dark rocks. Uh, you can sometimes find them in rocks when you're looking in for cryptoendolithic communities in Antarctica, but they're growing in translucent sandstones, and they're growing within the sandstones because the sand grains are trapping water films, and they're growing within the water films uh, and utilizing the light from the, uh, from the sand, uh, light from the sun coming through the translucent sand. Uh, uh, so... Uh, the meteorites are very jet black stones, and they're kept dry in museums. In fact, it's been known for a long time that the Orgoya meteorite is destroyed by liquid water. Uh, so it does not make sense that uh, these can be dismissed as simply uh, contaminants. 
So in response to the question, is life restricted to the planet Earth or is it a cosmic imperative, I would argue that recent discoveries indicate that liquid water exists today on Mars, on comets, on Europa, Enceladus, Titan, and many other icy moons of the solar system. We now know that microbial extremophiles do survive and grow at sub-zero temperatures. They grow in permafrost. They grow in glaciers. They grow in, in very hot uh, environments associated with fumaroles and volcanoes. So all of the necessary conditions for biology to exist on comets and the icy moons are there. And they may have served as cryorefugia for the protection and the distribution of life, and therefore the, dis the biosphere may extend far into the cosmos. I want to thank uh, Professor uh, Alexei Rosanoff and David McKay and uh, Academician Ivanov, uh, Sabita Buizov, and David Yelichensky for the very, very fine collaborative uh, studies that we've done and, and wonderful conversations I've had with Academicians of Arzin, uh, Ludmila Gerasiminka and, and uh, Elena Picuda and Rosemary Ripka for many discussions about cyanobacteria, sulfur bacteria, and archaea. Thank you very much. Alors, on ouvre le bail des, ah, des questions. I may need a headset. <laughs> ah, or... Oui, OK. OK, excellent. OK, thank you. Voilà, alors, qui commence Qui se lance N'hésitez pas. Oui, c'est vrai qu'hier, on a eu quasi trois quarts d'heure de questions. Donc... Euh, Oui, merci. I would like to know if over the last three or four billion years the number of comets has changed in our solar system. The number of comets that have crossed the Earth's uh, uh, orbit in the last three to four billion years I can't give you that number, but it has been very, very high. Uh, comets during the early part of the Hadean were extremely abundant. Uh, they were colliding in very, very great numbers, uh, comets and asteroids, and we know that from the, the record of the lunar surface, which has preserved imp evidences of these impacts uh, very nicely. The planet Earth doesn't preserve evidence of these impacts because of the atmosphere and the oceans, which have destroyed most of them. But there are a few big astroblems that still exist uh, from, from huge impacts. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I can't give you really a, a number as to how many, how many impacts we have had uh, during the last uh, 4 billion or 4.5 billion years of the history of the Earth. But uh, I, w I would like to uh, to add, uh, but will they decrease or increase over the next two billion years? Uh, for example? It, it decreased dramatically at the end of the Hadean. Uh, so you had a you had a huge period of bombardment uh, to about 3.8 billion years uh, because the solar system had just been formed. Uh, there was lots of of rocky and icy bodies that were were. Uh, coming into, into the surface of the Earth. Uh, after the, the Hadean, the, the number dropped off very dramatically, and I don't think there has been any evidence of, of any kind of a significant change. You have two basic large groups of comets. You have the, the comets that originate from bodies disturbed from the Oort clouds, and most of those comets come roaring in from far out in the far reaches of the solar system. Uh, uh, they're, they're not... Uh, far beyond the or the orbit of, uh, of Pluto, uh, they're they're not coming from within the ecliptic plane. Uh, the Oort cloud is a big sphere that goes around our entire solar system. So, the Oort cloud comets come in from from essentially any direction, and in almost all cases, they're on uh, hyperbolic trajectories in which they roar past the Earth. Come maybe if there are Earth crossers, uh, come into the inner solar system, come by the Sun, and then go back out into, into distant space. Uh, there is also the, the Jupiter family of comets, uh, the Kuiper Belt uh, comets, and those are coming 
from much closer in, and those typically are the comets that, that have nice periodic orbits, and, and they, in many cases, they are Earth crossers. Uh, both uh, uh, Orgaya and Murchison are from Earth crossing bodies, uh, and, and in fact, all of the meteorites that we have have to be from bodies that cross the Earth's uh, orbit, or they would never be here. Uh, and, and in fact, the studies that were done of Murchison uh, by Sargent et al. Uh, indicate that uh, the, the uh, meteorite itself was actually traveling in the same direction as the planet Earth and overtook the Earth because it was going a little bit faster. So the Earth is going around the sun like this and the meteorite is coming in like this. So the relative velocity between the meteorite and the planet Earth was very, very slow compared to what it would have been if the Earth had been going like this and the meteorite had been coming from the other direction. And we think that the carbonaceous chondrites that are preserved, they're very fragile objects, and we think that the carbonaceous chondrites that we happen to find uh, uh, all probably originated from that kind of very special conditions, uh, that they had a relatively low velocity with respect to the Earth as they came in, into the Earth's atmosphere. Une autre question Moi, j'ai une question. Si on devait euh, synthétiser, donc, si on devait synthétiser euh, toutes ces discussions, quel est le plus bel argument pour euh, prouver que les fossiles de bactéries qu'on découvre dans, euh, dans les météorites sont vraiment d'origine extraterrestre ah, Jean-Marc, could you translate, please The translation wasn't functioning. Donc le plus bel argument pour montrer que ce n'est pas des contaminations. Mm -hmm. Ah, the, in, what's the most convincing evidence that these are truly indigenous to the, to the meteorites? Uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, there are three lines of evidence that I consider to be highly convincing. Uh, one, I, I didn't tell you, but I do all of my studies from freshly fractured interior surfaces. So I take a piece of the meteorite and I break it. And then being very careful as to which surface uh, is on the outside uh, as I hold it and fracture it, then I orient it on the stub so that the freshly broken surface is what I'm examining. Uh, so these are from the inside of the meteorite, not from the outside of, of any piece of meteorite that I study. Uh, and, and even then, um, as you could see in many of the pictures, many, in fact, the majority of the, of the bodies that appear to be microfossils are actually coming out of the rock, firmly embedded in the rock matrix. Well, that, that implies that they belong there. They're not something that, uh, that dropped onto the surface after it was uh, broken. Uh, the other thing that implies that they belong there is their chemical composition mimics the composition of the meteorite. They have the same suite of elements uh, that you find in, in the meteorite, uh, but the abundances are dramatically different from the rest of the rock matrix. But they don't have strange elements that are not found. Uh, for example, uh, chlorine is very rare in, in the Orgaia meteorite. Uh, chlorine is found in a lot of, a lot of modern biological materials, but uh, uh, it's, it's uh, absent in, in the fossils. Uh, phosphorus is also relatively uh, uh, scarce in the fossils and relatively scarce in the Orgaia meteorite. But the most important, I think, of all is, uh, is the nitrogen observations. Uh, nitrogen is absolutely essential to all living things. You have to have nitrogen for all the proteins. You have to have nitrogen for all the amino acids, and without nitrogen, you don't have life. Uh, however, after an organism dies and has remained dead for a long period of time, geological periods of time, not historical periods of time, the nitrogen starts being diagenetically lost as it's converted to nitrates and to ammonia and then released into the atmosphere. So truly ancient fossils of fish, of trilobites, and so forth, don't have detectable nitrogen in them. But old stuff like mammoths and, and uh, Egyptian mummies and so forth have almost the same amount of nitrogen as modern things. Uh, so uh, 
I think the nitrogen data is absolutely the best evidence that I have that these are truly fossils, that they are absolutely not recent contaminants. And that's the most important question because if these are recent contaminants, they're not of any significance. If they are indigenous microfossils, they are clear and convincing evidence that extraterrestrial life exists. Thanks. Another question? Yes. Um, I'm going to try in English. Ah. So, uh, on, on the microfossils you find, do you find evidences that um, microfossils works on the DNA structure or is it possible to imagine another structure for life? Ah. Uh, you're asking, do I think that these uh, microfossils uh, had DNA? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all of the biology that we have on Earth has either DNA or RNA. Uh, and it's the DNA, the RNA for the viruses, uh, uh, which I consider to be biological entities, the DNA for the bacteria and archaea and eukaryotes and so forth. Um, so DNA is absolutely a requisite for life as we know it on Earth, um, the bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. <laughs> But uh, it's the DNA that governs what the organism looks like, that carries the template that tells it how to build its, its exterior structures and so forth. So the fact that I'm seeing structures that are uh, in, in almost every case recognizable or at least associated with the right kind of size range, the right kind of morphology, tells me that these probably were ordinary biological entities. Now, I, I should tell you there are some strange things that I didn't show. I found some uh, really bizarre bodies in, in the Orgelia meteorite that uh, look truly uh, uh, undescribable. Uh, uh, and, and they contain a chemistry that is uh, not Uh, associated with uh, with typical biological materials, they they have carbon and oxygen, and sometimes as much as 38 to 40 percent fluorine, uh, very very high fluorine content. Uh, so there are a few things that I found in the meteorite that uh, you know, I've had people say, well, gee, these things look just like Earth bacteria, Earth microorganisms, therefore they must be from Earth. Well. Uh, there are things that are found in the meteorite that don't look at all like anything I've ever seen on Earth. But the problem is I look at them, I say, I think they're biological, but I certainly can't associate them with anything that I know to be biological. So uh, uh, there are some strange things within the meteorite as well as these, uh, these very recognizable filamentous forms. Another question? Oui. Uh, yes, please. Uh, suppose we are convinced that extraterrestrial life exists. Is it sufficient to conjecture that the life on Earth originates from extraterrestrial life? I, I don't think you can necessarily conclude that. Uh, but the, the reason I am suggesting that, uh, that extraterrestrial biology may have played a very significant role is from several lines of, of reasoning. One, uh, the time in which life appeared on Earth was very, very far back in time, at least 3.8 billion years ago, possibly further back than that, because basically in order to get evidence of biomarkers, uh, you have to have well-preserved rocks. And when you look at the more ancient rocks than that, you wouldn't expect to find even chemical biomarkers. So that means that the window of time in which uh, life originated now has become not, uh, as we originally thought, two billion years, but it has now become a window of 100 or 200 million years. So, so it's an onion skin layer. And the other thing that's, uh, that's fascinating is the bacteria hopanes that were found in the 3.8 billion year old rocks indicate that biology had the same kind of chemical processes and the same kind of metabolisms and so forth as does modern biology. And, and the fossils that we can find in, in uh, the 3 billion year old rocks or so, certainly the 2.7 uh, Karelian fossils, I see cyanobacteria that, by gosh, it looks like it came right out of the pond. Uh, uh, they're 
no difference at all in size, no difference at all in morphology, no difference at all in structure, no difference at all in, in appearances of reprodu reproductive processes and so forth and so on. So at least as far back as 2.7, 2.8 billion years ago, cyanobacteria was absolutely recognizable and absolutely clearly the same kind of stuff it is today. And cyanobacteria is phenomenally complex. Uh, so basically, we know that very ancient organisms on Earth were incredibly complex. The, the protocell has never been found. No evidence of any protocell has ever been obtained. And, and therefore, it suggests to me that we may be looking at a situation that whenever the planet Earth got a liquid water ocean, had conditions suitable for life, life appeared. And that suggests an infection phenomena rather than a long evolutionary phenomena. And that's totally different than what modern biologists are going to tell you. Most people, the vast majority of scientists will say that's about the craziest thing I've ever heard. And, and I, I admit that it is a crazy kind of idea, but it is an idea that I think is supported by the observational data. And, and, and I go back to the idea you can see a lot by just looking. Uh, if, if you observe these kinds of structures, and, and what I'm saying is that anyone that wants to see microfossils in these meteorites, you have to do two things. You have to get a sample of the meteorite, and you have to put it under an electron microscope. And that's it. And then sit there and, and look for a while. But they're not so rare that you won't be rewarded in a very short period of time. Uh, and, and since I now have over a decade of study of microfossils and meteorites, and, and I found microfossils in every sample of Orgoya and every sample of Murchison that I've studied. I've not found any of these filamentous bodies in the CB3 uh, or the CB5 carbonaceous chondrites. I've not found any of them in stony meteorites and diogenites and nickel iron meteorites. All seem to be totally devoid, but the things that appear to have come from comets, most of those meteorites seem to contain various levels of, of these kinds of filamentous microstructures. Uh, so I think that what we're looking at in CI and CM carbonaceous meteorites, at least the CI1s and the CM2s, are the remains of comets and that those remains of comets carried with them the fossilized remains of biology and maybe from time to time they may have even brought intact living biological organisms to the earth. And if they did and seeded the earth with cyanobacteria, we would look at those and say, oh, well, those are earth organisms without realizing where they actually originated from. And then if we see similar kinds of things in the meteorites, we would have a tendency to say, it looks so much like earth organisms, it must be a contaminant. Question suivante. Um, I think answering the question where life appears is, is, a, is a great, great thing. But isn't is the the true question we ask we have to ask is how how life appears? Is uh, I think I think it's the is the true question. And does in your doing your research uh, can give us some some ways to answer how life how life appears, but not really where. Very, very good question. Uh, the, the only thing I can tell you is uh, I, I, I really think that uh, the scientific community is on to something in, in the kind of studies that have been done about the formation of amino acids by Miller-Urey synthesis and fischer trope processes and so forth. Clearly, life, even if it came to Earth from some other body, life had to have originated somewhere and some when. Uh, the point is the, the changing of the paradigm changes two things. It changes the volume of space in which these processes could have resulted in the evolution and origin of life. And, and it changes the time period that is available because we know there are, there are stars that are, well, there's evidence of stars that are 15 to 20 billion years old, which is somewhat embarrassing if the universe is 14 billion years old. But... <laughs> Regardless of what date you take for the origin of the universe, uh, whether it was 
Big Bang uh, uh, of an age of 14 billion years, and, and we're wrong about the age of some of the old uh, uh, red giants. Uh, the, the age certainly would be increased from 4.5 billion to at least uh, 12 or 13 billion. And, and a change uh, of that magnitude is really profound because, uh, of course, the, the, I, sh I shouldn't say 4.5 billion. I should say 100 or 200 million, which is the amount of time that you would have if life originated on the planet Earth and then was, was growing at uh, 3.8 billion years ago from 100 or 200 million to of the order of, of uh, 5 billion or more, which is a, a very, very significant change. But again... I, I'm, I'm not sure that this really helps out with the, the big question of how did life actually originate uh, and, and where did life actually originate. But until we start thinking in terms of, of uh, are our ideas, are our paradigms correct or are they wrong, then we won't have an open mind to search for new evidence. And, and that's big, been one of the large problems. Uh, People have not been studying and searching for microfossils in meteorites very actively because uh, after Ed Anders published his famous paper in 1965 on contaminated meteorite and said, oh, this, these microfossils in the Orgullia meteorite are a big hoax, uh, anytime you mention hoax or Piltdown Man, any decent scientist is going to run for the woods and, and actually refuse to touch it. In fact, Alexei Rosanov had his paper on microfossils and carbonaceous meteorites that sat on his desk for two years because he was afraid to publish it. And he only made the decision to submit the paper for publication after David McKay's paper appeared. So he actually had a very, very important paper announcing his study of microfossils in, uh, in carbonaceous meteorites. And he was quite frankly fearful of the impact to his scientific career if he published such a ridiculous and radical idea. Uh, and, of course, when David McKay's paper appeared, it was a paradigm shift, even though now most scientists say that David McKay really didn't find evidence of microfossils. And, and in fact, I have to tell you, quite honestly, I think they may be right that uh, his evidence is not compelling. Uh, but what he did by this paper that was published on the Allen Hills meteorite is he caused NASA and the rest of the scientific community to realize that we really hadn't been looking at what kind of biomarkers can you recognize for evidence of biology? How do you go and look for life on Mars and how do you recognize it if you find it? You know, all these big fundamental questions had been sort of shoved into the background and the people that were studying exobiology were basically the group at Ames and a few other groups that were sitting around redoing Miller-Urey synthesis and Fischer-Tropsch synthesis over and over again, trying to figure out how they could make cells in the laboratory. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of very brilliant scientists spent an enormous amount of time. And, and I have to tell you, I don't think we're really very much closer to the formation, the artificial formation of a living biological cell than we were in 1950 when Miller and Urey found out that you could produce amino acids uh, in, a, in a test tube. Biology is really complicated stuff. Une autre question avant de passer à Alexandra. Je n'en attendais pas de moins de toi. That was a very interesting presentation. I'm a molecular biologist, and so this is all new to me. So I'm really intrigued about the very strange forms of what you think might be former life that you s you've seen. You mentioned this, um, this uh, animal or whatever that was having a very high fluorine content. And yeah. I think you also passed quickly over something that was very rich in silicium. Could you... Would you happen to have some slides about those very strange things? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. If I can <laughs> find them, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be glad to look for them and see if, we can, uh, if I can pull them out. I, I transferred a lot of stuff off my computer when I went to Antarctica. Um, the, the high silicon content is not really surprising. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of things have high silicon, and sometimes uh, we pick up a high silicon content when we're looking through a carbonaceous sheath 
because there's silicon in the underlying rock matrix. Um, I, I spent uh, since 1966 studying diatoms, and diatoms build these beautiful intricate shells of silica. So having, having a relatively uh, uh, good content of silicon is not terribly surprising. There are lots of, of organisms, uh, radiolaria, silicoflagellates, uh, diatoms, and so forth, that, that contain a, a high silicon content. Having a high iron content is not surprising. Uh, we were collecting iron bacteria today, and, and there are lots of organisms that, well, as I showed, put gold or uranium on the outside. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of organisms uh, do bioaccumulation of various uh, metals and, and other elements, and sometimes they collect these because they need it or they want it, and sometimes they put it on the outside just to get rid of it because it's a bit of a nuisance. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I can find. Um, let's see if I'll do, I'll do a search and see if I can locate MHNP5. And if I can, I'll show you some strange things that I'm not going to take any responsibility for whatsoever. <laughs> let's see here. Let's see if I can get in the inorgaia in here. These are really, really bizarre, uh, bizarre things. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to do a search to see if they're if they're here. Uh, no, I shouldn't have mentioned it. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, we'll let that go off and do its hunt, and maybe we'll find something. <laughs> You'll have to believe me if we don't find them. They're really, really bizarre things that are there with this high fluorine content, uh, but hopefully it'll come up with uh, dredging them out of the, the bottom regions of my computer. Maybe While we're looking, are there any other questions? Yeah, maybe in the meanwhile, another question uh, going on uh, on this uh, DNA story. So if, if there was a part of the, the, the cell where DNA was located, you would expect to have phosphorus there. What would you expect phosphorus to become over such a long period of time? Would it also disappear? Uh, it, it, yes, there is. That is one of the interesting points. In fact, I can show you. Uh, uh, phosphorus is not nearly as abundant as nitrogen. Uh, and, and if when we look at, uh, at living and modern materials, it's not at all uncommon for the phosphorus level to be below the level of detection of my energy dispersive X-ray spectrometer. Phosphorus is present, but it has to exceed, uh, uh, it has to exceed 5,000 parts per million in order for me to pick it up with the EDS. Uh, and I can show you some of the, uh, the spectral data from uh, uh, hair of my dog and woolly mammoths and... Uh, and so forth, and, and in many cases, even though I know it's living organism, uh, the phosphorus is either barely detected or not detected at all. Uh, I may have to, let me see if I can grab the other drive, because I may have it on here as well. Uh, I'll, if it doesn't work, I'll search this one and see if there's... <laughs> If the file is there. Okay, are there any other questions? D'autres questions dans, dans l'Assemblée? Ok, ou on passe peut-être au. Ah, l'autre. Oui, j'ai une question peut-être un peu plus naïve ou plus, plus simple, mais. Euh, quand on a de, de la vie exogène comme ça, euh, non seulement il faut que cette vie atteigne la Terre. Oui, je disais que ma question était peut-être un peu naïve. Ou... Oui. Yes. I still don't have a translation. I, I heard her in French, but not in English. Ah. Ah, okay, wait. How do, ah, okay. I'll try this one. I speak some French, but not well enough. <laughs> a 
Okay, let's try again. No? Nothing. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. No. But maybe did you understand the question? Ah. Ah. Okay. <laughs> what is your question? <laughs> we'll let Jean Marc translate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bon. Merci. Excellent. Now, yes. Okay, all right. Oui, donc en attendant votre recherche de fichiers, oui, je voudrais poser une question, peut-être euh, une question très, très simple. Euh, non seulement euh, pour avoir une hypothèse, donc que la vie, euh, la vie sur Terre soit donc exogène, il faut non seulement que cette vie atteigne forcément la Terre, mais encore que cette vie puisse se propager sur la Terre et continuer à vivre. Alors ma question très simple. Yes. Donc ma question très simple est de savoir euh, lorsque euh, cette euh, météorite atteint la Terre, est-ce que les conditions aussi bien de pression que des questions que des, des problèmes de, de, de chaleur et tout qui se dégagent lors de l'impact euh, n'altèrent pas la vie de façon telle à ce que cette vie ne soit plus euh, ré répandable sur la Terre? Very, very good questions. Uh, the first point is about uh, uh, the life. If it came here, how could it have been in conditions that were suitable for it to continue to live on, on Earth? Uh, one of the things that we, we know about microbial extremophiles, about all life on Earth seems to require a simple set of conditions. It has to have water. That's something that seems to be absolutely essential. Uh, and it can remain alive, viable, even if it gets put into a desiccated state for a long period of time in many cases. It has to have a source of energy, but that source of energy doesn't have to be sunlight, but it can. It, it, it can be organic chemicals. It can be chemicals themselves uh, and so forth, uh, heat energy and, and the like. And it has to have this small set of chemical elements, uh, the biogenic elements. Well, these biogenic elements are quite common in the cosmos, and, and in fact, uh, uh, that's one interesting thing about all living organisms on Earth. They, they all have this same requirement for this same suite of subset of elements from the 92 elements of the periodic table. So the next point is, wouldn't the biology be destroyed as the meteorite comes through the atmosphere? And, and that is a very, very interesting point uh, because most people have the idea that when the meteorites come through the atmosphere, they become extremely hot. And in fact, we see fireballs associated, as I said, when the Orgullia meteorite came in, there was a huge fireball. Uh, people thought the end of the wor world was coming. Uh, when the Murchison meteorite landed, I was in Australia, and I talked to a lady who had actually been hanging her clothes out on the clothesline, and she looked up, and there was the sun. And then she looked in the other direction, and there was the sun. So she was kind of confused because there were two suns in the sky at the same time. And then she heard these tremendous explosions, and within a matter of a fraction of a minute afterwards, big rocks started raining down around her. One came through a, uh, a, a, a roof of a shed across the street from where she was standing and landed on some, uh, some hay in, in Murchison also. There was a person in the shed who was not injured, uh, but quite surprised, <laughs> and uh, Uh, and uh, pieces of Murchison landed on a golf course, and they hit and bounced and rolled. And then when they stopped, they caused the grass to turn from green to brown, so they scorched the grass. But the point that is important about all of this is that when these samples of, of carbonaceous meteorites have landed on Earth, they have been hot, but not incredibly hot. Uh, and, and by that I mean 
they've been below the temperature of ignition of uh, organic matter, of, of hay and so forth. Uh, um, so that's first point, and the question is how can they do that? Well, the answer is they're very much like an Apollo command module or a space shuttle. They have very low density, uh, so they're not like the nickel iron meteorites and the stony chondrites, and they also have very low conductivity. So when they come into the upper part of the atmosphere, there, there is a lot of a big fireball formed, and a lot of the heat is carried away by ablation in exactly the same way that we designed the, the uh, nose cone uh, and the reentry vehicle for the astronauts coming back from the moon. They were very much like meteorites coming into an Earth trajectory and entering the Earth's atmosphere in a, in a way very similar to what a carbonaceous chondrite might enter. And the heat shield was designed in such a way that the ablation carried away most of the heat, but if you had seen an Apollo spacecraft coming in, it would have looked like a huge fireball. Uh, and, and anyone seeing this would have said, how would it be possible for human beings who are very, very delicate organisms, uh, it's very easy to kill a human being if the temperature goes too high, uh, how would it be possible for human beings to survive such a fiery reentry? Well, the answer is they survived the fiery reentry because the temperature inside the spacecraft remained relatively cool and the outside got very hot. Now, the reason I'm convinced that that's what's going on with these meteorites is we have uh, detailed records from a series of letters that were written to uh, uh, Les Marie and, and others uh, right after the Orgueilla meteorite landed. And in those letters uh, of a wide variety of people that saw the fireball and that picked up the stones, some of the people like Madame de la Pile uh found a stone the next morning that was covered with frost. And this was on May 14, 1864, uh, in, in Orgueil and Noic, uh, France. So there's, uh, there's no suggestion that it would have been cold enough for the stone to become uh, covered with frost unless the inside was very cold and, and it caused the outside to get cold and water condensed from the air and then froze into frost. So what I'm saying is nickel iron and, and stony chondrites get hot and the heat is conducted to the interior. Carbonaceous meteorites are perfectly designed, if you want to think in those terms, for transporting biology without killing it through an atmosphere. I mean, it's almost like <laughs> if you wanted to design a reentry spacecraft for a microorganism, I don't see how you could possibly do a better job than encase it within very cold ice and, and allow it to have an ablative surface on the outside that could carry heat away as it comes through an atmosphere. Quelqu'un a encore une question euh, à poser Ou bien on passe à la partie euh, microscopie en attendant que le PC finisse de trouver le fichier Alexandra, c'est pas gentil. Ok, je pense que tu veux nous montrer des choses intéressantes que tu as trouvées aujourd'hui. Oui, je vais le mettre ici et voir si je peux faire une recherche ici. Parce que je ne trouve pas quelque chose là. Et. Oui, oui. We'll, we'll continue searching for the uh, strange guys I was talking about. Maybe I'll have more luck here. Let me just take a quick look first. Qu'on appelle du direct? 25. No. Uh, well, let's. May not have it with me, unfortunately. Let's try searching for it anyhow. Uh, try that. Okay, uh, let's. Huh? What? Did it find something? Ah, 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 we're, lu we're in luck. <laughs> we're in luck. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Ah. 
Let's just try the... Um, there. Voila. This looks biological. Uh, let's but very strange. is kind of big filaments. But uh, let's look here at EDS data. And uh, uh, yeah, I may need to, uh, wait a minute. Uh, let me, it's hard to see. I'll have to brighten it for you. Okay. Now, uh, there is this strange filament. Here it is in boron, in carbon, in nitrogen, in oxygen, and fluorine. I mean, just an incre and and uh, you you see in in aluminum. Of course, this is on an aluminum stub, so that's showing up very bright, and this is dark. In silicon, so we've got fluorine, we've got silicon, we've got oxygen, a little bit of nitrogen, carbon, a uh, small amount of boron, phosphorus, we can see it, uh, sulfur, chlorine, potassium is a no-go, calcium, uh, and then we come down to see the rest of the elements in the 2D X-ray map, uh, and barely see it in co copper, and chromium and everything is just totally dead here in iron. Uh, a little ha fine hint there in, in nickel. Uh, so uh, I thought, well, you know, we've got fluorine, we've got uh, carbon. There are some minerals that are like that. Uh, cryptohalite is, is one of the minerals uh, that I looked at, and I actually got samples of cryptohalite. It was first found in Vesuvius. Let me let me show you what I mean about the spectrum. This is H23. That's this guy. And here's the spectrum of that particular guy. Uh, Okay. Uh, now we're seeing a big aluminum peak, uh, which we have to ignore because it's sitting on an aluminum substrate. But uh, uh, notice here, in this case, we're seeing 17% fluorine, 9.8% uh, carbon, 2% nitrogen, definitely a, a real detection of nitrogen, 11% oxygen, 46%, uh, that's the aluminum that we throw away, 8.9% silicon, a little bit of phosphorus, a little bit of sulfur, all of these others are non-detected. Uh, and, and there are some that have even higher levels of, of fluorine than, than what we're seeing there. Uh, 25 is, uh, well, let's see what, okay, 06. Yeah, no, that's, let's look at the 25 spectrum and see what that looks like. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the even more astonishing ones uh, uh, here. Here we're seeing, uh, uh, there's the fluorine peak, and it's 34% uh, fluorine, 19% oxygen, 27% carbon, and 2% nitrogen. And we're seeing a little bit of sodium and magnesium, 
uh, and and we're not seeing the silicon because it's such a big filament. I mean, the aluminum because it's such a big filament that I can put the beam entirely on the filament, and I'm not picking up background from the aluminum stub, silicon and phosphorus. Uh, so, 34 percent fluorine is just astonishingly high, uh, and and yet these things, they they look uh, biological but they don't look like any biology that I've ever seen. Uh, I'll show you some of the other, well, strange, big, big filaments uh, as we have here. Uh, very, very strange, intercoiled things, wrinkled. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, I have no idea what kind of thing that is. Uh, I certainly don't have never seen anything in biology, anything in I, I, I do a lot of crawling through mud and swamps and gathering things and and I've never seen anything like that. Uh, so it has all the characteristics of being some kind of a biological entity, but uh, uh, when you when you see uh, these uh, now this is this is the meteorite rock matrix here. And, and this is a big, huge filament coming out in both directions here. And uh, uh, when, when I look at that in, uh, well, this is, this is part of that big uh, filament, and this is the end of it. Ah, yes. You see where it terminates. I mean, and, and this is the uh, scale bar down here, that's 10 micron bar. So this is a big object. Uh, definitely right size to be some kind of biological entities. But uh, uh, I, I haven't published these because I don't know what to say about them. <laughs> and this is, this is nice because uh, this is a visible light picture. Uh, and we can see the aluminum stub there. And uh, here is this funny guy in white light, and, and you see the colors are sometimes black, you see with little bubbles, oops, uh, the, the, this region up in here is very, very jet black, and this is, is like uh, a coal. Uh, it, it certainly has the, the color and characteristics of a carrageen. Uh, black and dark brown, uh, um, not uh, uh, certainly doesn't look like uh, recent uh, recent biological contaminant. And and in fact, I, I don't think anyone will accuse this of being a recent biological contaminant because if they do, I'm going to say, oh really, show me what organism it is, because <laughs> I would like to have some in captivity. Uh, I all I can say is. The meteorite contains some very, very bizarre things, uh, and this is uh, this is a good example. Uh, uh, and, uh, so, uh, amazing stuff. Uh, just, uh, just. Uh, little filaments interconnecting uh, this it looks like growth of some kind uh, but uh, what it is is indeed a mystery to me uh, so actually I'm not sure we, we can turn this on and see if we can find some guys here that are interesting this I don't know if the water is dried out but let's uh, let's see what we have to do is unplug the uh, uh, the computer, right? Uh, how do we switch to uh, to the camera? Uh, well, we're ah, okay. This is. Uh, this is not live. Uh, this is 
uh, Spirochaeta americana, the spirochaete that I discovered a few years ago uh, from uh, Mono Lake. Uh, yeah, you can you can see one of them up there. These these bacteria are a new species of spirochaeta. Uh, they're 200 nanometers in diameter, so. Uh, they're about one, uh, well, let's see, a human hair is typically uh, 30 microns, so about 150 times smaller in diameter than the diameter of a human hair. Uh, and there you're seeing them like anacondas uh, uh, swimming by. They're, they're really, really quite, uh, quite spectacular, quite beautiful organism. This poor guy here is stuck to the slide, and he's kind of wiggling, uh, can't quite make any progress, uh, uh, and the others are, oh, maybe he's <laughs> going to get free as he gyrates wildly. Uh, uh, but in, in fact, uh, this is a new technique. I'm using a, a new kind of dark field condenser that allows me to go to very, very high magnification. Uh, uh, we, we have never before in my laboratory had such uh, incredibly beautiful images of, of bacteria like uh, Spirochaeta that is so incredibly uh, small in, in diameter uh, in, in living state. Uh, as, as you can see, they're, now they're in and out of focus because as far as they're concerned, that flattened drop of water that they're in is an entire ocean, so they can swim in the upper layers or the lower layers of the, of the water ocean, uh, even though it's, it's uh, of the order of... Uh, uh, a micron or so in thickness, uh, as far as they're concerned, it's quite a, uh, quite a thick uh, regime. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's a really, really beautiful uh, spirochaeta. Uh, and now we'll, uh, let's see if we can switch to live. Let me get things turned back on again. Okay, if anything's still there. It looks like I'm going to have to put a fresh sample on because all the bacteria that were running around earlier have adhesed to the slide. Uh, not seeing any any nice motility here like we had. Uh, let me let me get a fresh sample here. Do I what? No, it's okay. Uh, I'll just uh, stick on a new slide. We'll put somebody new down. And uh. They sat there and, and got angry with me because time went by from the time that I had prepared it. Uh, so... This is from uh, the quarry at uh, Otrage. Otra Otrage. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we have uh, nice iron bacteria. I'll try not to get it too thick. Nous avons prélevé des, des échantillons de dépôts de, bactériens euh, qui se déposent dans, qui se forment dans des environnements assez euh, peu communs. Enfin, en fait, ils sont très répandus parce qu'on on n'y prête pas beaucoup attention. Mais ici en particulier, ce sont des dépôts que vous avez certainement déjà tous vus, des dépôts un peu rougeâtres, qui ressemblent un peu à de la pollution. Il y a, il y a des films un peu huileux, comme ça, si vous vous promenez dans les Hautes-Fagnes, 
Euh, vous avez certainement remarqué des dépôts rougeâtres dans des, dans des ruisseaux ou des, ou des choses ainsi. Il y en a beaucoup dans les carrières. Et nous sommes allés dans une carrière. Euh, vous savez, quand on creuse un trou, on finit par tomber sur l'eau. Donc les carrières sont obligées, de, pour continuer à travailler à sec, de pomper de l'eau. Et quand elles pompent de l'eau, ben, l'eau qui, qui reste dans la roche tend à, à, à ressortir, à faire résurgence. Et elle ressort par des fissures. Et cette eau contient en général beaucoup de fer. Ça, ça dépend du, du sous-sol. Mais elle contient du fer qui est à l'état réduit. Et il y a des bactéries qui ne font rien mieux que d'oxyder le fer. Euh, ça se fait sans elles, hein, mais elles le font. Elles sont là pour euh, prendre l'énergie chimique en fait, de l'oxydation du fer. Et comme le fer, est relativement, le fer une fois qu'il est oxydé, est relativement insoluble, il se dépose. Et vous avez ces dépôts rouges un peu, un peu gluants, un peu filamenteux, parce qu'il n'y a pas que des bactéries ferro-oxydantes. Il y a toute une communauté euh, microbiologique. Bon, je ne suis pas microbiologiste, donc... Euh, euh, mais il y a des cyanobactéries aussi qui sont là, uniquement parce qu'il y a de l'eau, comme Richard l'a dit, pour, pour qu'il y ait de la vie, il suffit qu'il y ait de l'eau. Il y a de la, lu la lumière. Et euh, donc on a pris ces échantillons. Euh, ce genre de dépôt rouge intéresse beaucoup les, les chercheurs de la, de la NASA parce que euh, du fer, il y en a beaucoup sur Mars. Donc on, on s'attend à éventuellement pister, à rechercher des bactéries ferro-oxydantes euh, sur les échantillons qui vont retourner des missions euh, de Mars. Donc euh, j'espère que ça va... Il y en a, hein, puisqu'on a une étudiante, enfin une, une étudiante, Séverine ah. Papy, qui est ici, qui a fait son mémoire de licence d'ailleurs sur, euh, sur, sur ses, ses dépôts et d'autres. Euh, elle, elle a fait des frottis, elle a observé effectivement toutes ces bactéries. On a fait de la microscopie électronique par balayage, les images grises que vous avez vues là. Euh, donc normalement il y en a, mais apparemment ils ne veulent pas se montrer. Oui, c'est du... Le professeur Hoover est un grand improvisateur, je l'avais remarqué sur le terrain aussi d'ailleurs. Je suis en train de me focaliser ici. Je pense que j'ai des graines dans... Ah. Ah, je suis en train de me focaliser Oh, c'est une carrière de grès là de grès car carbonifère, donc les roches sont noires, sont riches en sulfure de fer. Et euh, ce qui intéresse euh, Richard Hoover, ce n'est pas seulement les, les bactéries qui oxydent le fer, mais surtout des bactéries qui éventuellement oxydent le fer. C'est pas une bonne préparation. J'ai eu des graines et j'essaie de le faire de nouveau. C'est assez difficile ce que fait le, le professeur Hoover, puisque euh, d'habitude, les, les microbiologistes, d'après ce que, que j'ai vu sur le terrain, quand, quand Séverine le, le faisait sur le terrain, comme dit M. Hoover, il tue les bactéries puisqu'il les fixe dans un milieu comme de l'alcool ou des choses ainsi. Euh, M. Hoover préfère les voir vi vivantes, les voir nager, les voir, etc. Donc, euh, c'est un peu plus délicat, je suppose. J'imagine. Moi, j'étudie que des cailloux, des choses mortes de, qui ne bougent pas, donc euh, qui se conservent très bien. Et donc, euh, je ne vais pas pouvoir parler longtemps comme ça. Hein. Je, je, non, je vous préviens. Hein, je, Live experiments ne fonctionnent pas la première fois. having to clean off the immersion oil. This is a rather complicated technique in that the, uh, uh, the substage uh, condenser is a dark field condenser that has to be uh, oiled to the, uh, to the slide. Uh, I'll tell you what I think we're going to do. Uh, and, and that immersion oil is actually thicker than what I use. Uh, so we're going to try the other oil, which is thinner, but still not perfect uh, so we'll try try again and, uh, I actually maybe someone would have another question while I'm trying to <laughs> <laughs> demonstrations never work perfectly the first time Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah.
Yes, I can hear you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oui, voilà. Les images que vous avez montrées mm -hmm. et, et pour lesquelles vous ne savez pas voir de référent euh, biologique connu par vous, en tout cas, mm -hmm. j'imagine que dans le monde du vivant que nous avons sur la Terre, ces images de l'ultra petit, il doit y en avoir des, des milliards. Et je ne sais pas si les biologistes qui sont ici en plus que vous ont la connaissance pratiquement de cette vision du vivant. de façon suffisante que pour qu'on puisse quand on, quand on voit ces images de dire oui, effect, oui, oui effectivement il s'agit bien de quelque chose d'inconnu ou, ou, ou quelque chose de connu mm -hmm. that's an excellent question uh, uh, um, uh, I would uh, perhaps there are some Bi uh, biologists, microbiologists here. I, I know Jean-Marc has done a great deal of work on, on fossil uh, bacteria. Uh, are, there, are there any people here who actually do work with microbiology uh, and, and perhaps even uh, cyanobacteria? Uh, we have some experts in cyanobacteria here. Uh, well, Jean-Marc, you, you, you do a lot of work with, uh, with microorganisms uh, yourself. Uh, uh, what, are, what are your assessments of the kind of things that you've seen? I'm going to do it in French because everyone is equipped with casques, except me, I guess. Donc Richard vient de, de me demander un petit peu comment... Bon, je ne suis pas microbiologiste, je le répète, Richard a dit que j'ai effectivement j'ai euh, travaillé sur des, des bactéries fossiles du, qui datent du Crétacé, donc vous voyez, c'est une époque très très très, très ancienne, euh, simplement en, en comparant des, des, des morphologies, mais beaucoup de gens vous diront que la morphologie, ce n'est pas suffisant. Euh, effectivement, il y, y, y a des débats, comme, comme le, dit, le dira très bien Richard aussi, euh, de comparer ce qu'on observe avec ce qui est connu. Alors, ce n'est pas parce que deux morphologies sont, sont, sont les mêmes, deux, deux objets ont la même forme, particulièrement pour le vivant qui est petit, ah, est où les formes sont simples, qu'automatiquement, on peut dire que ce sont les mêmes. D'abord, ce sont des organismes. Si vous comparez ce que vous voyez sous le, sous le microscope à un organisme vivant connu qui est mis en, en culture, ou etc., vous ne pouvez pas nécessairement dire que, de un, c'est la même chose, de deux, c'est vivant. Enfin, c'est peut-être mort au moment où vous le voyez, mais c'était à l'origine un être vivant. Donc, il y, y a un gros débat sur, le, sur la morphologie. Seulement, il y a une chose qui, qui est très importante euh, au niveau du savoir-faire scientifique, c'est que la plupart des gens qui critiquent la morphologie sont des gens qui ne sont pas, qui n'ont jamais fait, en fait, ne sont pas des observateurs. Or, euh, il y a beaucoup de... Il faut savoir que Richard Hoover ne détermine pas, en tout cas au début, n'a pas déterminé lui-même ses microfossiles, mais il a parcouru le monde, non pas pour les collecter, c'est facile, pas seulement, mais aussi pour faire le, le tour des spécialistes. Qui, euh, des cyanobactéries, des, des, des bactéries qui oxydent le soufre, enfin, etc., et, et de montrer euh, les images prises, etc., et de demander l'avis de ces spécialistes. Et d'ailleurs, sans dire à l'avance que, que cette image a été prise dans une météorite ou dans, ou dans un environnement, donc un, comme ça, à froid, je veux dire. Et la plupart des, des, des micropaléontologistes, oh, qui ont une grande expérience visuelle, qui analysent en fait la, la morphologie, ils ont un catalogue, pas seulement ah, en tête, puisqu'ils oui. publient, ils font des recueils, eh bien, se trompe extrêmement rarement. Donc les critères morphologiques sont, marchent quand même bien, mais quand on les maîtrise. Et c'est un, un, un peu comme un musicien qui sait lire de la musique alors que quelqu'un d'autre ne le sait pas. C'est un peu l'image qu'il m'a qu donnée, je pense qu'il a tout à fait raison. Et on perd un peu maintenant, de plus en plus, ce sens de l'observation, de la classification. Et il faut savoir que tout, beaucoup de choses en biologie, encore une fois, je ne suis pas biologiste, mais en, il y a encore beaucoup de choses, des pans complets de la biologie, comme la géologie d'ailleurs, qui sont basés sur la morphologie. Alors ça marche sur un... 80% des choses, peut-être que ça coince pour les 20% qui restent. Et actuellement, évidemment, on se focus, on, on, se, on, on se concentre sur des techniques de bio, biologie moléculaire qui, qui vont étendre beaucoup plus. Mais on perd un peu, je pense, tout, tout cet acquis, euh, toute cette expérience qui, qui, est, qui est basée sur l'observation. 
qui peut être trompeuse quand on n'est pas habitué. Et je pense que le grand mérite de Richard, c'est de vous avoir montré des choses. Il a, il a le mérite de vous montrer des choses qui paraissent bizarres. Et il dit, je ne sais pas ce que c'est. Et il a raison. Tant, tant qu'on ne sait pas ce que c'est, euh, il ne faut pas commencer à inventer n'importe quoi et bêtement comparer euh, de quoi ça a l'air. Donc quand il étudie des morphologies, quand il les propose à des, à des experts, il y a une analyse morphologique qui est, qui est, qui est faite. D'après ce que j'ai compris sur les cyanobactéries, il n'y a pas que le, le diamètre, il n'y a pas que la forme générale, il y a aussi la, 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 la présence de parties spécifiques, comme pour la fixation de, de, de l'azote, euh, le fait qu'il y ait une gaine, etc. Donc il rassemble un maximum de, de caractéristiques morphologiques qui font qu'ensemble, ce n'est pas une preuve, mais c'est un ensemble de, 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 de traits qui concourent à, à attribuer ces formes à de la vie. Corollaire de ce que vous venez de dire, ces formes très particulières qu'on a vues, est-ce qu'on peut imaginer de les voir sur la Terre dans des choses que l'on sait ne pas être vivantes Donc c'est peut-être les artefacts dont vous parlez. Mais en, en particulier, euh, oui à première vue, et Richard sera, sera d'accord parce qu'il y a, il y a un, un, pas mal de scientifiques actuellement qui s'acharnent à reproduire en laboratoire des, des formes qui imitent la vie des formes tout à fait inorganiques donc qui font pousser des cristaux dans des conditions bizarres et ça forme effectivement des cristaux qui peuvent être courbes, euh, spiralés euh, en bouquet qui ressemblent beaucoup à des choses euh, que l'on attribue à du biologique et effectivement quand, si vous voyez ça si vous voyez, si vous, ben, vous dites, ok il ben, y, y a moyen de se tromper par contre si vous montrez ces formes à un micro-paléontologiste il dira non, ça c'est pas vivant sans, sans à, à froid encore. Hein, je ne veux pas dire qu'il y a une part de subjectivité, mais il y a quand même une, toute une connaissance, toute une expérience. Et les paléontologistes, euh, en fait, sont extrêmement, ont un sens extrêmement aiguisé de l'observation morphologique parce qu'ils ne, ne font que ça. Et ils ont une, un peu une stat, une stat, des statistiques en fait, morphologiques en tête. Donc ils savent très bien tout de suite dé détecter un, arte un artefact. Et notamment les artefacts inorganiques qui ont été créés en laboratoire sont en, en général très bien dé détectés par les, par les paléontologistes. Donc euh, voilà. Mais je crois que l'argument très fort que, que, que les études de, de Richard Hoover ont, ont apporté ici, c'est euh, d'aller vers euh, la recherche de cette fois-ci de, de preuves, enfin d'arguments chimiques. Et notamment cette question de l'azote est très très intéressante. Parce qu'effectivement, quand la matière organique se décompose sur des temps géologiques, quand, quand le pétrole se forme, quand le charbon se forme, les premiers éléments qui partent, c'est l'oxygène et l'azote. Et donc, effectivement, d'ailleurs, il, il c'est écrit dans les slides, il ne l'a peut-être pas dit, mais la matière organique qu'il y a dans les météorites de type chondrique carbonée, c'est du kérogène, c'est-à-dire c'est la matière organique fossile que l'on a en, en abondance dans, dans les sols, dans les sédiments marins. C'est une matière organique qui est vieille, qui a, qui, qui, qui a déjà une certaine maturation. Donc déjà, ça, ça colle mal avec une contamination... Euh, donc ce qui est assez troublant, je vais dire, je ne suis pas tout à fait entièrement d'accord avec certaines interprétations de Richard, mais en tout cas ce qui est troublant, c'est que c est, c est ce qui montre n'est pas une contamination terrestre récente. C'était bien dans la météorite avant, avant qu'elle tombe. I've had to go away from the oil immersion because the one oil is too thin, the other oil is too thick. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, we'll go to regular dark field but I'll go to a little bit higher power and we'll go back to, uh, to lower uh, magnification objective to see if we can't see the bugs that are running around on this slide. Uh, Almost like a galaxy. Ah, and here's a nice diatom. Pierre, tu pourrais descendre luminosité? Ah, and another diatom here. And here is some of Jean-Marc's 
kind of beasts? Oh, and look at the look at the organic matter in this diatom. Uh, ah, and he's swimming slightly. And this one is swimming, you see. Not moving so fast. Let's see if we can find somebody else that's can a diatom. Big filamentous cyanobacteria here. A living cyanobacterial filament. Ah, who's this? Ah, it's a diatom. It's a synedra, or no, nichia. And he's going up and down. I'm having to chase him a bit. This is. And. And you see the diatoms, these are not very big diatoms, but they're giants of the field because you see all these tiny little specks down here that are swimming very rapidly, moving around. These are bacteria, smaller bacteria. Ah, another diatom. Looks like uh, these are probably Cymbella. Lots of little bacteria. Nice diatoms. All in and around. Oh, here's one swimming. Two of them swimming around this clump of... Well, I had thought it was a clump of iron, but it may be... A, oh, it's just a bunch of diatoms. Look at this. And we're seeing the chloroplasts on the inside. That's the, uh, the organic matter inside the diatom where it's storing its food. Another diatom. Ah, he's nicely motile. Not very fast, but swimming. May, yes, there he goes. The diatoms that can swim have a V-shaped groove in the, uh, in the cell wall called a rape. These are the pinnate diatoms. Uh, the centrics, and we haven't seen any centrics here, like the, uh, the circular forms and so forth, they, they, cha they move by uh, uh, changing their, uh, their buoyancy. Well, some giant creature just went by at a high rate of speed. I don't know who he was. He went so fast we lost him. Uh, uh, and, you know, this is, this is a drop of slimy water, and you can see how much fun you can have <laughs> with every little drop of uh, nice, beautiful diatom there. Is, is it showing well on the screen? Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, uh, yes. It's, it's nice to have six-foot-long diatoms, isn't it? <laughs> Usually they're a lot smaller than that. And look at all these beautiful little bacteria here. Ah, look at the chloroplast, the nice greenish chloroplast in this diatom. The diatoms are called the golden brown algae because they mask the green color of the chlorophyll with a golden brown pigment called diatomin. Uh, but they're, they're profoundly important uh, organisms. Uh, I may have to plug up my camera. It's thinking I'm thinking I'm gone to sleep. I don't want to look at it anymore. Uh, yeah, we can record some of this as we're going along. That's one of the nice things about this kind of system because when you see something interesting like this little pair of diatoms swimming across the stream here, uh, you can make a video of it as you're watching and enjoying the, ah, and off he goes in the other direction. The, uh, they're called the golden brown algae because they have this pigment that masks the, uh, the chlorophyll. 
but they are profoundly important to us because by their photosynthesis, they generate enormous quantities of oxygen. And in fact, it's been argued that perhaps in excess of 50% of the oxygen replenished into the atmosphere is coming from the diatoms. Uh, so it's not the great tropical rainforests that are giving us our oxygen. It's, it's these diatoms and cyanobacteria that are the, uh, the primary uh, actors responsible for the, uh, the replenishment of oxygen to the Earth's atmosphere. So this is, this is really quite beautiful because even though these diatoms are not terribly big, you can see them in comparison to these tiny bacteria that are like little stars dancing around down in their uh, tiny, tiny galaxies. Uh, uh, and here we have uh, some of the iron bacteria. And oh, look, look at the, look at the spiral filament, uh, Jean-Marc, coming out of the edge of this. You see in the, at about 7 o'clock. So... We may get uh, a Gallianella and Lepithrix, and uh, of course, if I were to find a nice Spirochaeta, I would be more than happy. Uh, I have to tell you, this is the first time that I've I've looked at this sample. Uh, uh, oh, it's just beautiful, beautiful diatoms in the in the assemblage. Uh, um, well. We just got it this afternoon, so <laughs> I haven't had a chance to explore, but uh, it's, it's really, really quite, uh, quite nice. Uh, diatoms are, as I started, oh, here's a, the, the complete fruit stool is seen in side view of that diatom. Uh, they they have, uh, carry out their mechanism of locomotion by... Uh, exuding uh, cytoplasm from a polar nodule, and it comes along this V-shaped groove called the wraith and goes into the diatom at the center. Uh, I've got a pointer, and I've got a specimen. So it comes out of the polar nodule. Well, we, this is one with the wraith that we can see coming along and going back in at the, at the central nodule, and then it comes back out and goes along the groove and goes back in at the other polar nodule. Now, my wife's great-great-grandfather uh, argued uh, that this was a form of, uh, of propulsion from squirting material out and, and uh, action and reaction kind of, uh, of physical phenomena. Uh, that was a good idea, but it absolutely is not correct. What is happening is that the diatom is, is actually only able to, to swim or to move when it's in contact with a substrate. And it turns out that this uh, material that's being ejected is, is sticky and it sticks to the substrate, and so the diatom really isn't moving along like a rocket-propelled uh, object at all, but instead he's moving along very much like a snail. And in fact, the scientists that discovered this found that they could, uh, they could use a stain, and, uh, and they could see the trail that was left as the diatom crawled along a, uh, a glass slide. And of course, it uses this uh, mechanism for moving along sand grains and and moving along uh, uh, particulates of uh, of uh, uh, plants and and so forth. Uh, so they have all of these uh, wonderful abilities. I'm just going to see if we see anybody else here. Uh, it's, there is. There are many of these diatoms, uh, many of them Cymbella. We've seen some. Uh, uh, this one's swimming fairly nicely. Uh, a nice long rod. But all in this starry... Ah, that's that guy is really really going uh, all in this starry field of bacteria. Uh, it's, uh, it's telling me I'm about at the end of my uh, uh, tape. That's all right. Uh, we're not recording anymore anyhow. Each time you look at a, at a new sample, you see all sorts of interesting things. Each tiny drop is a, is a whole world of, 
Ah, ah, this may, you see the spiral here? Uh, uh, this may be your Gallianella, you think? Mm-hmm. Yes. But he's not moving. Uh, so maybe Gallianella is not modal. Uh, we were having the discussion about this this afternoon, and I was telling Jean-Marc that I thought the Gallianella would probably swim because of their their morphology, and that one is telling me maybe I'm wrong. So we we have to. My diatoms are swimming nicely. Uh, uh, <laughs> he's not a very big diatom either. Uh, uh, these uh, these magnificent. Uh, well, it's not. Terribly, I guess it's because it's being magnified to such an enormous state. It looks much better on the on the small screen uh, than it does up on the huge screen. But uh, maybe if I stood back further, it would look better. <laughs> Anyhow, the, 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 these are absolutely wonderful uh, bacteria, absolutely wonderful plants. Uh, the the diatoms are studied by botanists and uh, and algologists. The bacteria, of course, are all studied by uh, microbiologists. So. Anyhow, are there any other questions uh, about the universe and its surroundings or anything else I may have missed? Une dernière question. Avant de s'ouvrir, on retourne de l'autre côté de la cantine. OK. Je pense qu'on va arrêter ici, peut-être. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. And... And I, and I want to say thank you because uh, this has been the most attentive and the most wonderful audience that I have ever had. Uh, I, I, it's it's very rare that you get questions that last so long with such an, an interested group. And I thank you very much. I, I know I've told you many things that some of you may find are very strange and, and unusual. And uh, uh, but. Everything that I have said, I firmly believe, is correct, and uh, I'm, I'm working to convince the rest of the of the world and the scientific community that microfossils do exist in meteorites. Uh, but it is a difficult challenge because there has been so much uh, uh, of, of an idea that this is impossible for so many years that I'm having to sort of fight an uphill battle. But I'm continuing to fight and struggle and having fun at the same time. If NASA ever finds out how much fun I'm having, they'll tell me to go away and fire me. But uh, I try to keep it a secret. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. <laughs>